One Drops Dead, an Autumn Heights cozy mystery novella, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter 1. Autumn Heights. Lightning flickered over the town, shortly followed by a low growl of thunder. Rain had already made the streets slick, and even though it was only late afternoon, the old-fashioned street lights had automatically turned on in the gloom. Mature trees lined the avenue, slowly losing their battle against the frosts of autumn, leaves turning yellows, oranges, reds, and browns before drifting to the street. Autumn Heights was an old town. Most of the buildings were well over a hundred years old. The downtown core was no different, with brick storefronts abutting each other, each with their decorations for the season. It was October in Autumn Heights and no other town in all the country did autumn quite like the citizens of this small town. Currently I was pedaling my lady's cruiser bicycle as fast as I could, given the rain and the costume I was wearing. The gauzy material was a hazard, trying to get caught in the chain despite the fact I continuously tried to wrap it around one arm to keep it out of the way. Joan, the cemetery tour manager, would kill me if I arrived at the dress rehearsal with a ripped gown. Not that my character wasn't dead already. Really, the way Mary had died, you would think there would be a rip or two in her gown. Every weekend of October, Autumn Heights put on a cemetery tour. I have been playing Spencer Mary Becker for eight years now. One might hope Joan would let me off the hook of dress rehearsal night as I could recite Mary's lines in my sleep. But not our resident theater buff and acting arts manager. Joan insisted everyone be at the dress rehearsal, in costume, prepared, rain or shine. Soaked in white and gray gauze, I was turning into the cemetery. Poor Mary was going to look especially pathetic for this particular round of acting, I thought ruefully, as I traversed the path which would lead to the main mausoleum where our group of intrepid actors had agreed to meet. Already there was a small crowd of people gathered, some with umbrellas, others in ponchos. Why hadn't I thought to bring an umbrella or rain gear? I wondered for a moment. Because I had been late getting out of work as usual, my brain replied. Mentally shrugging, I slowed the bicycle before swinging a leg over the middle bar. Letting the Victorian-style gauze wedding dress hem hit the ground, I leaned the bicycle against an edge. Hey, Vi, have you seen Joan? Cedric Parsons checked his watch a frown marring the jagged fake wound gaping down his face. It's not like her to be late. I didn't see anyone coming up the path. I shrugged, unconcerned. It wasn't like Joan to be late, yet sometimes people were. I checked the lady's pin-on watch I had on the chest of my costume. It's only seven minutes past the hour. I'm sure Joan is just running a little behind. Maybe she grabbed some last-minute items for the tour. Or... Maybe she forgot it was tonight, grumbled Sue Ling, clutching her poncho closer and stamping her feet. I should have brought a coffee. Sue practically lived on Java alone. She was rarely without a travel mug or takeout cup. Coffee or hot chocolate, agreed Martin Kent. Cedric checked his watch again. Joan would never forget. She lives for the cemetery tour. It's one of the few times she gets to order people about. Maybe we should call her? Does anyone have her phone number? Sue wondered. No one replied. I certainly didn't have Joan's number, as I wasn't particularly close to her. It appeared the other members of the acting troupe didn't have her phone number either. Has anyone seen Cat scanning the crowd? No, I haven't, replied Martin. Maybe she's with Joan. Pulling my phone out of my pocket, I swiped through the lock screen and opened the contacts list. Cat was pinned to the top under the title Favorite Daughter. It never changed, even though she was my only daughter. Holding the cell phone next to my ear, I listened to it ring. I'm lost, came Cat's plaintively annoyed voice. It's dark in the cemetery, and every path looks the same. We have flashlights, and are dead center in the cemetery by the mausoleum, I noted dryly. You should be able to find us. Ugh, not funny, complained Cat. I feel like I'm biking in circles. Oh, wait, I think I see the lights. 
could be a street light, I mused. I gasped as though a thought occurred to me even as I teased her. Maybe you're not just lost, but are in a parallel universe. Maybe the fall moon opened a portal and we will never find each other again. The only way to communicate will be through our phones until the batteries die. Really, Mom? Drama much? Cat slowly pedaled to where I was standing. I put the phone away and looked Cat over. Nice costume. You make a great little orphan. Maybe Joan can reuse it if the town does Oliver Twist as the next play. The dirt on the cheek was a good touch. Cat rolled her eyes and tried to wipe her cheek, leaving an even larger smudge. It's not intentional, and the pants are getting really tight and short. I think this is the last year I'm going to be able to do the orphan part. Joan's going to have to find someone else next year. Speaking of, is Joan mad that I'm late? No. I shrugged before slinging an arm around her thin shoulders. Funnily enough, Joan is not here yet. Huh. I thought she was a stickler for punctuality, frowned Cat. Stickler for punctuality? I half laughed at the phrase. You say it all the time, defended Cat. Yeah, but I'm old, I excused myself. You are just a young thing, a babe in the woods, the cemetery woods tonight. You are not that old. Cat arched an eyebrow, looking slightly ridiculous under her tweed cap. Her auburn hair she had inherited from me threatened to escape. You were only seventeen when you had me. Let's not repeat history. I gently chided her, checking my watch again. The little minute hand had ticked to twenty past the hour. Joan is really late. Maybe she's sick, suggested Sue. Can we just call off the rehearsal? A hopeful Martin asked, stamping his feet and blowing on his hands to try to warm them. Cedric held up his hands to get everyone's attention. Does anyone know where Joan is? Uncertain murmurs were the only replies. Then I propose we get the rehearsal started, stated a firm Cedric. Joan will just have to catch up to us when she arrives. The group agreed, and soon we were trudging down the cemetery paths stopping at graves and listening to biographies of the local dead. Some of the stories were soulful, some humorous, and some not quite believable. Mary Becker was the unwed daughter of Mauve and Charles Becker. I began my particularly well-known routine, casting a sweeping arm toward Mary's grave. She had high hopes of marrying, sewing her wedding gown, and trousseau by her own hand. Alas, Mary was overlooked by the town's bachelors, leaving her single and labeled as a spinster at twenty-four years of age. I cleared my throat, pushing a wet lock of hair out of my face. Mary felt her only role was to be a mother and wife. On October 30th, All Hallows' Eve, Mary donned her wedding dress, walked through the town square to the downtown Silver River Bridge before throwing herself off into the waters below. Unable to swim, Mary perished by drowning. She was found amongst the rocks and reeds of the Silver River, her wedding gown floating around her like a white cloud. Lightning sparked through the sky, illuminating the cemetery like it was daylight for a moment. My eyes were drawn to a black, cloaked figure on the edge of our small crowd. Thunder shook the ground beneath my feet, and a second bolt of lightning lit the area. The cloaked figure was gone. A shiver ran down my spine. I blamed it on the rain, even as I knew better. Chapter 2 Shadows Maybe we should call it a night, suggested a nervous Sue. It feels like the storm is getting worse. There are only two more stops on the tour, Cedric pointed out. It won't take long. What is the weather supposed to be tomorrow night? wondered Martin. I hope it doesn't rain for the tour. Clear skies, assured Sue. It might even warm up a little. Nice, noted Martin, nodding his head. I wouldn't mind calling it a night, I ventured, thinking of the cloaked figure. A pit of tension knitted itself together in my stomach. Great. Let's just get the dress rehearsal finished so we can all go home, grumbled Cedric. Joan owes me for this. It's like hurting cats, dryly stated Cat as she came to stand beside me. Cats. I laughed a little. That's funny, cat talking about cats. Mom, 
Cat rolled her eyes. We should get a cat and call it Cat. Then we would have an animal cat and a Katrina cat, I pointed out. People would love it. No, they wouldn't. My daughter disagreed. Besides, you don't have time to take care of an animal. That's what you always tell me. True. I looked round the rows of graves as the group walked onward. What are you looking for? asked Cat. Joan, I lied. In reality, I was looking for the creepy, shadowy guy. Then again, maybe that had been Joan. I tried to tell myself. But why would she dress like that? I wish she were here, sighed Cat, tugging on her coat sleeve as she removed a stray thread. No one really likes Joan, but she does keep us in some sort of order. Privately, I agreed. Joan might be difficult. However, she could organize like no one else. I'm having a hot bath and a hot cocoa when we get home. Mmm, cocoa, purred Cat. Can we use the good chocolate? When do we not? I questioned. When Grandma and Grandpa come, Cat gave me a knowing look. They wouldn't know good chocolate. I scoffed. They're too cheap. Uh, we are pretty cheap, too. Cat rolled her eyes. No, we aren't. I corrected her smugly. We are frugal. Same thing, shrugged Cat. Shh, it's Brayden's turn. Do you still have a crush on him? I whispered, leaning toward my daughter's ear. Shush! Cat shot me a horrified look. Sorry, I murmured half listening to the gangly teen's oration of child labor and dying in the nearby silver mines before the turn of the last century. His grave was a mere stone marker in the ground, etched by hand with the family name. The only reason anyone knew about the boy was from the records the town heritage committee had unearthed. It turns out one of the boys from the silver mine had a mother who wrote letters to her sister in another county. Without those, there never might have been a record of the grave's history. Do you think there's any silver left in those hills? If we had some, we wouldn't need to be so frugal. We could afford things like heat in the winter and chocolate for the entire town. Mom, hissed an embarrassed cat, her pale cheeks flushing. Try to be a little bit cool, would you? Okay. I held up both my hands in surrender. Brayden had finished, so the group wandered back to the mausoleum for the finale. Cedric stood on the steps, readying himself for the last oration. The fake wound along his face looked particularly garish in the light of the two carriage lights framing the wooden doors. Cedric leaned forward, his deep voice warming to his role. Frederick Yates, otherwise known as the Red Slasher, is Autumn Heights' only known serial killer. Born to Dr. Carl Yates and his wife Janice, Frederick had a troubled childhood, full of disease. Frederick cheated death twice, first from a particularly bad bout of measles that hit Autumn Heights, leaving twelve dead. Then later, he survived scarlet fever. Frederick was in trouble with the law five times on nuisance charges. His father bailed him out each time, and Frederick never faced any jail time. It is believed he killed at least eight people, perhaps more during his killing spree. First, it was the Yates family maid, a mere lass of sixteen years. Records say the motive might have been that she spurned his advances. Then he killed the neighboring family, the Reynolds. Tom Reynolds was said to have scorned Rhetoric for his affliction of stuttering in a public street outside the Silver River Tavern. The family of five perished from being stabbed repeatedly in their beds. Dr. Yates suspected his son may have been involved in the Reynolds' deaths. When he and his wife confronted Rhetoric about his actions, there was an ensuing fistfight. Cedric ran a finger along the fake wound on his face. During the battle, the good doctor used a scalpel to defend himself, giving his son this scar you see here. However, Dr. Yates was no longer young. He was overpowered by his son. Frederick was found, burying the bodies of his parents in this very cemetery by a grave digger. He was found guilty of multiple murders at trial, and hung from the gallows in the town square. Cedric said in a hushed voice, before his tone rose to a crescendo. Or is the Red Slasher right behind you now? Chapter 3 The Silver River Lightning flashed again as the group looked involuntarily back with nervous laughter. The cloaked figure stood back toward the trees, amongst the graves again. Mom? 
A concerned cat asked, Are you okay? Yeah, I murmured distractedly, as a second flash of lightning showed that there was no one where the figure had been standing just a moment ago. The pit in my stomach grew a little larger. I'm fine. Do you think it was a bit much? wondered Martin. There will be kids on the tour. Frederick's story is a bit violent. Well, he was a serial killer, Cedric mildly mentioned as he descended the steps of the mausoleum. It's bound to be a bit gory. Maybe leave out the bit at the end, ventured Martin. I still jump when you yell about the red slasher behind us, and I know what is coming. Let Joan decide, sighed Cedric. She is in charge of the tour. Fine, sniffed Martin. Just think it should be toned down for the kids. What do you think of it, Cat? asked Cedric. Was it too much? I'm not exactly a little kid any more, defended Cat, shooting a quick glance to Bryden. I think it's cool, said Bryden, taking off his cap and scratching the back of his head. This wool is itchy, though. You can't date him if he has head lice, I whispered to Cat. Cat turned to me in horror. She shook her head and made a quick slashing motion across her neck. Sorry, I muttered. Bryden cleared his throat awkwardly, his face red. I don't have head lice. Good to know. I smiled pleasantly at him to cover my gaff. Are we done here, Cedric? pleaded Cat. My mom is past her bedtime and needs her meds. Hey, I protested. I am not on any meds. You should be grumbled Cat as she picked out another loose strand of twill on her coat. I guess we are, sighed Cedric. If anyone finds Joan, tell her I would like to speak to her. The group broke up, going their separate ways. Good night, muttered Bryden as he walked past Cat and down the cemetery path. Night, I merrily called out. He seems like a nice kid. He is never going to date me, sighed Cat, her shoulders slumping. Why not? I asked. Not that I want you dating since you're only fourteen, yet I'm sure you are dateable. He's with the popular crowd, moaned Cat. Bryden is too cool for me. Plus, you talking about head lice? Probably just put the last nail in that coffin. Nail in the coffin? I grinned. We are in a cemetery. That's too funny. You know what I mean. Cat gave me a little push on the arm. Can we go home now? I have homework to do. Absolutely. How about I order pizza tonight? Or do you want Chinese takeout? My mouth watered at the possibility. Wonton soup, breathed Cat. Chinese it is, I readily agreed, already pulling out my phone. The delightful dumpling was on speed dial. Not that every restaurant in town wasn't on my speed dial. It didn't take long at all for the phone to be picked up. Placing our usual order, I ended the call before grabbing my bicycle. How do you even manage in that skirt? questioned Cat as she easily mounted her bicycle. I would be so scared it would get caught in the chain. With flair, I responded as I flipped the skirt up and onto my arm. I carefully balanced on the bicycle and set a foot to the pedal. I'll get the Chinese food if you get the hot cocoa going. Hot cocoa and Chinese food? Yuck, remarked Cat. I'm not sure that would be a good combination. Well, we won't know unless we try, I told her. I started pedaling, but it wasn't long before Cat passed me on her mountain bike. Maybe for dessert, she called out over her shoulder as she continued up the path ahead of me. As we cycled down the avenue away from the gates of the cemetery, I slowed down. I didn't really know why, but at the top of the Silver River Bridge, I came to a halt and looked out over the waters where Mary Becker had thrown herself into the waters below. The river was dark in the rain the street light above reflecting in the current. I could hear the rushing river, swollen from the rain as it swept along. I shivered, feeling the damp in the air. A lightning bolt lit up the landscape. The river bank, trees, and buildings were starkly visible before being plunged into the darkness once more. Thunder barraged against my ears and vibrated the ground beneath my feet. Yet I stood still, looking at the bend in the river, hoping to unsee the dark-cloaked figure which had been haunting me all night. Another bolt of lightning showed the figure was still there. Leaning my bicycle against the guardrail of the bridge, I made my way down the embankment and alongside the river. The wind began to increase, a prelude to the incoming storm. My hair whipped around my face, and I stumbled, 
my foot slipping on the mossy rocks, submerging past the ankle into the river. The water grabbed at the wedding gown, soaking the satin underlay and weighing me down. For a moment, I felt unbalanced, wondering if I was about to fall to my own death like Mary Becker, before I managed to scramble up the bank, fighting through the small scrub. Ahead of me, the shadowy figure waited. Brambles scratching my hands, I pushed forward toward the bend of the river. Suddenly, there was no one there, nothing but myself and the river. Where are you? I yelled against the howling wind. Rain began in large cold drops, the friendly drizzle from earlier forgotten. Pushing back against the brambles, lightning illuminated the area. Then I could see the still form of a body on the ground of the river bank. Chapter 4 Grimm's When I was twelve, I went to a sleepover. We did the usual pizza party, movie, games, and failed at putting on makeup. It was a lot of fun. Except when at midnight, the birthday girl pulled out a Ouija board. I had been warned by my aunt to never play with Ouija boards, magic, or other things of an otherworldly nature. Yet this seemed harmless, just another game. Besides, my aunt was weird and old. What did she know about a girl trying to fit in and have fun? The Ouija board had seemed like a letdown. The girls at the party were all convinced the birthday girl was cheating by moving the planchette herself. An argument broke out, and soon enough we were sent to bed by the birthday girl's mom. However, there was a lasting after-effect. Three months later, I saw my first Grimm. Over the years, that's what I have nicknamed them, Grimm's. He was waiting at the corner of a busy street in Autumn Heights. I was walking home from school and saw a dark, shadowy figure in a robe following Mr. Tuttle, one of the teachers at the school. I had never particularly liked Mr. Tuttle. However, I couldn't really understand why no one else seemed to be weirded out by this guy in a Grim Reaper costume standing near the teacher. The next day, I heard Mr. Tuttle had died of a heart attack. Even then, I didn't really make the connection. It took years of seeing Grimm's to understand that no one else could see them. It really came to me in high school, when I was working part-time as an aide at the local nursing home. They would come, hovering over one of the residents, waiting for them to die. It wasn't the best experience for a 16-year-old girl. The only good news was the Grimm's never seemed to see me. Which is why the one at the cemetery during the dress rehearsal for the cemetery tour had creeped me out so badly. Never had a Grimm look directly at me before, nor had one of them shown up after a body was dead. They always preceded death in my limited experience. This one had seemed to lead me directly to a body, as if it wanted me to find it. I fell to my knees beside the person who was lying face down. Reaching forward, I put two fingers to the side of the neck, searching for any signs of life. There was no pulse. The body was cool to the touch, possibly because it was unprotected in the storm. Swallowing thickly, I summoned up my courage and tried to roll the person over. It was difficult. The person was very limp. The grass was long and in the way plus the ground inclined towards the river. The last thing I wanted to do was accidentally have this person fall into the river and be swept along in the current. Lightning split the sky, electrifying the air and bathing the world in light before plunging it back into darkness. In that moment of illumination, I saw that it was a man lying on the ground. I didn't recognize him. However, it wasn't like I knew each and every resident of Autumn Heights. Pulling my phone out of my purse, I quickly typed in the passcode before calling 911. After a few moments of speaking to the dispatcher, the ambulance and police had been notified of the situation and were on their way. Putting the phone back in my purse so it wouldn't get lost, I tried to do compressions as I had been taught during the last first aid class I took. The wind picked up, the rain poured down, and a clap of thunder pounded in my ears. I don't know how long it was before emergency services arrived. It seemed like forever, 
yet at the same time also so soon. A paramedic took over the CPR. The other EMT had me move back as they assessed the person. I watched as they went through their routine, their conversation making me believe there was little hope this man would make it. I shivered, wet and cold. Finally, the man was lifted onto a backboard, and the ambulance attendants began to slog through the knee-length grass. Since the vehicle could not go down the steep side of the road onto the riverbed, we had to make our way back to the road and bridge. I could see the lights of police cruisers as they arrived on the scene. The ambulance loaded the man into the back of the vehicle. Before leaving, a paramedic wrapped a foil blanket around my shivering shoulders. I was soaked through as I watched the other EMT talk quietly to a police officer. The cop nodded, and the paramedics got into the ambulance before driving away. Miss Violet Resauter, another officer approached, pulling out a notebook. My name is Officer Pesky. I have a few questions to ask you. I nodded and pulled the silver blanket closer around me. It crinkled in protest. I had gone to school with Wendell Pesky and was well aware of who he was, even as he butchered pronouncing my last name, Rizudre. It was his own self-importance that had him announcing his name and position, I thought wryly. We had even been on student council together, so there was little reason for him to pretend he wasn't certain of my identity. You were the one who called emergency services, correct? asked Pesky. Yes, I agreed. Pesky wrote something down, then eyed my outfit. What on earth are you wearing? I realized I probably looked odd out in the middle of the night in an old and outdated wedding dress. Oh, this? We were doing a dress rehearsal for the local acting group. The cemetery tour is next weekend, and dress rehearsals were tonight. In this weather? There was a note of disbelief in Pesky's voice as his pencil hovered over his notebook. It wasn't raining yet? I tried to explain. You can ask Reverend Parsons. He was there. Hmm. The pencil scraped against the paper as Pesky made an irritated noise. Why did you say over the phone that it wasn't Joan? Excuse me? I tried to think of what he was talking about. Honestly, the whole evening since finding the body was a bit of a blur. I supposed it might be the shock. You said to the 911 operator that, and I quote, It's not Joan, he repeated. What did you mean by that? Chapter 5 Pesky, Pesky Oh, my memory was jogged to the point where I turned over the body. I suppose I thought it might be Joan. She was expected to be with the cemetery tour group tonight. We were practicing for next weekend's event. Joan is in charge of the whole thing, but she never came. She didn't phone anyone to let us know she wasn't going to be there. I guess for some reason my brain just automatically thought it might be her. Then I realized the person was someone else, and I must have just blurted it out. Do you happen to know the deceased? asked Pesky. No, I don't think so. I shrugged. It had been a man, maybe around my age, with nondescript features and short brown hair. How did you find him? questioned the police officer. I had stopped at the bridge to look at the river. There was lightning, and I thought I saw something, I explained. I went to have a look and found him. Pesky walked to the bridge, looking past the tree line at the riverbed to try to see the crime scene. He came back to me. I can't see the crime scene from the bridge. What did you think you saw that made you go investigate? I don't know. I could hardly say that it was a grim reaper that I had seen. Pesky would think I was off my meds. I gestured helplessly. I just thought I saw something strange, so I went down to look at it and found him. You're certain you've never seen the deceased before tonight? Never talked to him? He eyed me shrewdly. No, I don't think so. I shrugged again, wondering why Pesky has asked the question twice. Is he a tourist? I might have seen him at the information booth. We get a lot of people there, and I can't always remember them all. He isn't a tourist, noted Pesky with a grimace. The only thing he had on him was his wallet. 
Did you remove any objects from him, say, house keys or a phone? No, I didn't touch his pockets or take anything from him. I racked my brain, trying to think. If the deceased wasn't a tourist, that meant he had to be a resident of Autumn Heights. It was a fairly large town, but I had thought I knew the majority of citizens here. Who is he? His identification was in his wallet, mentioned Pesky. His address is 245 Maple Avenue. I stared at Pesky in shock. That can't be right. I live at 245 Maple Avenue. Apartment C? he asked. No, I'm apartment A. I frowned as a spark of recognition flitted through my brain. Is that quiet Carl? Quiet Carl? repeated Pesky. Carl is my tenant. I gasped in disbelief. I always called him ideal because he never complains. I never see him, and he always pays the rent on time. He's quiet Carl. He's rented from me for three years, and I only met him once when he picked up the key. Is there any reason you might want Carl dead? Suddenly asked Pesky as he leaned forward, pencil poised on a notepad. None, I sputtered, surprised that Pesky would ask such a question. He pays rent, which helps pay my bills. The last thing I want is an empty apartment. Did you have any arguments over the rent money? Questioned Pesky. No, like I said, I only saw Carl once he picked up the keys. He paid on time every month by putting an envelope in my mailbox. We never talked. I shivered again. I tried to remember if Carl had left any emergency contacts on his application form. I should probably call them. Or would it be better to give the information to the police? I was about to ask Pesky, but he interrupted me. Did you see anyone going to or coming from Carl's apartment? demanded Pesky. No, I responded. There was a reason Carl was nicknamed Quiet Carl. We never heard anything from his apartment. If he hadn't been paying the rent, and I hadn't seen the utility bill each month, I might have wondered if Quiet Carl even existed. He was absolutely the model tenant. Not once did I ever have an issue with him. Until now, that was. This was definitely an issue. Finding Carl dead in the reeds of the riverbank. Did he argue with anyone? Did he complain about anyone? Pesky wrote in his book. I wouldn't know, I replied. It felt like I was continually repeating what I had already said. I never talked to him except to give him the key to the apartment. Did you ever argue with him about the rent, utilities? Pesky's face was filled with suspicion as he looked at me. As I said, other than when he signed the rental agreement, we never once spoke. I repeated my earlier words. Were you romantically involved? questioned Pesky. No, I said firmly. Do you know if he was involved with someone? Who were his friends? I have no idea. I shrugged, starting to feel a little irritated by this line of questioning. My tone may have been a little sharp. Carl and I never spoke since he signed the rental agreement. Pesky gave a snort. He flipped his notepad closed. We may be reaching out with more questions later as the investigation continues. We will also need to see Carl's apartment. Absolutely. Any time you need to. I nodded, glad the interview seemed to be coming to an end. I'll let you know if we need to talk to you again, promised Pesky. He gave me his card. If you think of anything, let me know. Grateful to escape, I found my bicycle which was still leaning against the bridge. Involuntarily, I looked out over the river, giving another shiver as I watched the police, looking out over the area with their flashlights. Thankfully, I couldn't see any more Grimm's in the dark night. Chapter 6 To Tell the Truth I remembered to pick up the Chinese food. It was a good thing I did, as I had just made it before closing time at the delightful dumpling. The food was still hot, but it would probably be a little soggy from the weight it endured while I talked to the police. The rain likely didn't help either as I pedaled home. Deciding to forgo putting the bicycle in the garage, I simply leaned it against a planter on the porch. 
Hopefully no one would be bothered to try to take it, since it was still pouring outside. I am so hungry, greeted Cat as she opened the door for me. You took forever. I already have all my homework done. Cat spoke in the exaggerated fashion teens always seemed to employ. I wondered briefly if I had talked this way to my aunt while growing up in her house. I probably had, I decided. Setting the takeout on the counter, I debated telling Cat about what had happened tonight. I didn't want to upset her, but I also knew the town gossip would eventually reach her ears and she would learn all about it anyways. It was undoubtedly best to hear the news coming from me, yet I hesitated. "'Go get changed into something dry, and I'll dish out the food,' said Cat as she opened the bags. She had already set the table with my mismatch of various dishes found at garage sales over the years. The thing about Cat is, she is incredibly smart and mature for her years. Sometimes it's easy to forget she's only fourteen. While she held down a paper route, got top marks in almost all her classes, and did multiple extracurricular activities in an attempt to boost her eligibility for colleges, Cat also still slept with her favorite stuffed animal from childhood. My daughter was still at that sweet stage between childhood and adulthood, which made it difficult to determine just how much to say about quiet Carl. You're dripping on the floor, chastised Cat, tossing a towel onto the tired linoleum. She used her foot on top of the towel to mop up the moisture. Sighing, I went straight for the laundry room. Unbeknownst to Joan, I had inserted a hidden zipper into the dress years ago. I refused to have to do up and undo several dozen tiny pearl buttons just to don this dress. While Joan preferred authenticity, I preferred a bit of practicality. I tossed the dress into the washing machine and grabbed a large towel to wrap around myself before heading to my bedroom to get dressed. Cat and I had the first floor of the old Victorian house I had inherited from my aunt. The place had large windows with high ceilings, which made it a bit of a nightmare to heat in the winter months, and beautiful old moldings. Scarred hardwood floors and no longer usable fireplaces completed the beautiful home. At one time there was a servant's staircase in the back, but that had been taken out when the house had been converted into three apartments. There were two one-bedroom apartments upstairs. One was occupied by my long-term tenant, Greta, who was a retiree who still liked to work part-time and was a very active member of the community. The other apartment had belonged to quiet Carl. Grabbing a warm sweater on the way out of my room, I headed for the kitchen. I slipped the sweater on, trying to erase a chill that just wouldn't leave. Pulling out a chair, I sat down. Cat had already ladled out on our plates what we habitually ate. She expertly picked up a dumpling with her chopsticks. You might want to heat it up a little. Food was the last thing on my mind at the moment. I picked up my fork, more to have something to do with my hands, rather than that I planned on using it. Taking a deep breath, I decided to give the bare facts and answer any questions Cat might have. After the dress rehearsal, I stopped by the bridge. I was looking at the water and I happened to see something. This earned me Kat's full attention, as she was always curious. What did you see? I wasn't certain at first, so I went down beside the river to find out. I tried to explain, a shiver going through me. I found someone face down in the reeds. They weren't breathing and didn't have a pulse. I called 911. That's why I was late. I was talking to the police. For a moment, Kat didn't speak trying to absorb what I had just said. Wow. Yeah, I agreed. Who was it? Were you able to save him or her? You did CPR, right? How did they end up there? Rapid questions came from Cat, her food forgotten as she stared at me. I did CPR, but he didn't regain a pulse. The ambulance attendants didn't seem very hopeful. I tried my best to stay calm and collected as I told her the worst part. It was Carl. Cat scrunched up her face, trying to remember any Carls we might know. Quiet, Carl, I gently reminded her. Our tenant upstairs? Him? 
asked Cat in surprise. Yes, I sighed. I guess I'm going to be looking for another tenant. We both sat in silence for a moment, thinking over what had happened. You're okay, though, questioned Cat, concern in her eyes. I'm fine. I only lied a little. At least that was what I told myself. Besides, I'm the parent. I need to be strong, and sharing my concerns about Grimm's with my fourteen-year-old daughter was definitely not something I should do. I hadn't told her the worst part, nor did I intend to. While I had done CPR, there had really been no need to. Once the paramedics had shone their flashlights over Carl, it had been apparent he was never going to be revived. Carl had been bashed over the head with something which had connected with his temple. There had been a sharp cut in the skin and broken bone beneath. Chapter 7 A Black Cat The police came the next morning to ask to look at Carl's apartment. Thankfully, I was home at the time, pulling weeds out of the flower bed. It didn't take long to fetch my key to apartment C and hand it over to Pesky. Are you certain you don't remember anything else about Carl? questioned Pesky one last time as he accepted the key. I told you everything last night. I tried to keep my temper in check and reminded myself that Pesky was just doing his job. I also have a copy of the rental agreement if you'd like to see it. I would, nodded Pesky. I went back into the house to retrieve it from my desk in the living room. Despite the stack of unpaid bills and unorganized mail on top, inside the desk was neatly filed. This was more due to Cat than myself. She loved to clean and organize everything, and naturally, I let her. I grabbed the rental agreement and headed back onto the porch only to find that Pesky hadn't waited for me. Instead, he was already upstairs, unlocking the door to Carl's apartment. Slightly annoyed, I quickly followed him up the steps as he opened the door. A black cat with a green collar and tags came out, meowing loudly as it tried to weave between Pesky's legs. Pesky nearly tripped over the cat. Can you keep your animal under control? It's not my cat. The protest died on my lips as Pesky shoved the animal aside with a foot before entering the house. The cat yowled in protest, and I sighed. I held out a hand for the feline to sniff. You must be Carl's pet. What is your name, kitty cat? The cat gave my hand a delicate sniff before pressing against my feet and purring. I petted the soft black fur before carefully picking up the cat. I hope Carl's emergency contact liked animals and would take this one in. The shelter in Autumn Heights was already overrun with animals, and I would hate to have to bring the cat there. Officer Pesky? I ventured as I stepped into the apartment. It was like he had forgotten me. Already, Pesky was in Carl's bedroom, going through the closet. I closed the door and set the cat down. It rubbed against my legs with a purr. I looked around in curiosity and some surprise. Carl had been exceptionally neat. The place looked like it had been deep cleaned yesterday. There wasn't a thing out of place. No pictures hung on the walls, no extra furniture, no rugs, no knickknacks of any kind. Not even a mark on the walls to indicate he had hung a picture at one point. It was a minimalist dream space. It was like he barely lived there. Deciding to investigate a little further, I opened the fridge a moment to gauge if I would need to come back to throw out any milk or other items that might spoil. All his food was lined up perfectly, labels outward so they could be read. Mostly it was condiments in the fridge, but it was odd. What man organizes his own fridge, spacing out the jar so neatly? I shut the door and examined a nearby cupboard, only to find the same thing. All canned food was organized better than any supermarket shelf. Weird. There were no takeout boxes in the garbage, either. The man apparently liked to cook for himself. However, looking at his pans, I couldn't say they appeared to ever have been cooked in. They sparkled like they were brand new. I frowned and opened the microwave clean. 
Under the sink there were three pairs of rubber washing gloves, and so many cleaners, lined neatly in rows. I decided Carl was an obsessive cleaner. Which meant I didn't even need to clean this apartment, except to get Carl's old stuff out of it. Bonus for me. Immediately I felt a little bad for thinking that. The man was dead, and here I was thinking about cleaning his apartment for the next renter as I snooped through it. I shut the cupboard door and went to find Pesky, who was staring at a desk in the living room. Officer Pesky, I ventured, noting Pesky's frowning face as he glowered at the desk. Is there a problem? It looks like a computer was supposed to be here, mentioned Pesky. See all the cords? You wouldn't happen to know anything about this. No, I answered. This is the first time I've been in the apartment since Carl rented it. Do you think it was stolen? Pesky gave me a sharp look. Who else has a key to this apartment? Just Carl and I. I began to get a bad feeling in my stomach. Unless Carl made a copy and gave it to someone. I hope not. I would much rather not have to change the locks as it was expensive to do. And I was not a handy person, so it would be a bad idea to install it myself. There was no sign of forced entry on the door muttered Pesky, almost to himself. So either the person who stole the computer either knew Carl, or had a key. He looked at me as he said the words, his eyes full of suspicion. Chapter 8 An Inconvenience Or it could be in the shop for repairs, I said a little desperately. I could feel a little shiver of cold down my back as I took a step away from him. Maybe he left it at work, or someone borrowed it. I certainly don't have it. Pesky narrowed his eyes. You shouldn't be in here anyways. You're contaminating a crime scene. Oh, I didn't mean to. He hadn't even bothered to tell me to not go into the apartment, which I found a little annoying since he was now blaming me for being here. Let me just feed the cat and I will go. You need to leave immediately, ordered Pesky his frown becoming even more pronounced. We'll need at least a few days to look over the apartment and document everything. I will return your key when we are finished. A few days? Who will take care of the cat? I wondered. Pesky looked at me like it was an irritating fly. It's your cat. You take care of it. It was not my cat. Not that Pesky seemed to realize it, despite the fact that I had earlier told him exactly that. Gritting my teeth, I scooped up the black cat who was again rubbing against my legs, no doubt hoping for a meal. I held out the rental agreement paperwork. Here's a copy of the rental agreement. Pesky took it without so much as a glance at me. I decided I wasn't going to stick around for any more rude behavior. Good day, Officer Pesky. Don't leave town, darkly stated Pesky. I paused on my way out the door. Excuse me? I work here and my daughter is here. I live just downstairs. Why would I be leaving town? Pesky just ignored me, looking over computer cables which had no computer attached. I decided to retreat, leaving the apartment. Holding on to the cat, I looked for a tag on it to indicate what its name might be. All that was on the tag was a phone number, which I assumed was Carl's. No luck. I guess your next owner will get to name you, I muttered as I scratched behind the cat's ears. An agreeable purr greeted my words. Sighing, I made my way downstairs to my apartment. It was already getting late, and I needed to get dressed and on my way to my job. There was no time to call Carl's emergency contact. I would have to do it later. Setting the cat on the floor, I rummaged around in a closet until I found a plastic box big enough. Stay here. The cat had enough sense to stay inside as I went back to the flower bed. Grabbing the spade, I heaped some dirt into the box for a makeshift litter box until I could get to a store. Once I was back inside, I set down the box in the laundry room and put a bowl of water next to it. You get one slice of ham until I can get some real cat food. I told the cat, who meowed in appreciation, as I set down a saucer with the cut-up ham. I did not need a cat, 
I told myself. If Carl didn't manage to will the cat to someone else, then I was going to have to advertise it for free. Maybe I could save it from going to the local animal shelter. Shutting the door to keep the cat in the laundry room, I quickly changed into far more professional attire. On the way out the door, I grabbed my original copy of the rental agreement with Carl. I would call his emergency contact while I was at work. It didn't take long to bike over to Casings Insurance. It was one of the town's family-owned insurance brokerages. One of my many part-time jobs was there. Twice a week, I would take over the elderly receptionist Mabel's duties. When I first started the job, I had hoped that Mabel would ease into retirement and I could take over on a full-time basis. However, Mabel stubbornly insisted her retirement funds were not covering her basic needs, so she continued to work. I found out the reason the casings had employed me part-time was to avoid paying Mabel full-time for her position and thus not paying her benefits. The casings were notoriously cheap when it came to anyone but themselves. It was a bit of a letdown. However, I needed money, and it was a steady job with steady hours. Mabel picked up her bag as I entered the business. Everything is caught up but the filing. I will see you Thursday. Have a nice day, Mabel, I sweetly replied. It was always the same few words with Mabel. Nothing added, nothing subtracted. Once I had tried to talk about the weather with her, she was impatient to get out the door, so I stopped trying to be polite. As usual, there were heaps of files on top of the filing cabinets. I had the secret feeling that Mabel never filed a single file when she worked. However, I didn't dare to complain, as this was what kept me employed. Giving the desk a quick once-over to make sure everything was where it should be, I set down my bag and headed for the filing cabinets to get started. My phone rang, and I automatically answered it. It was one of the few perks that when I was working at the insurance brokerage, I could answer my phone whenever I liked. Hello? There are cops surrounding the house, Greta informed me. Greta was the tenant from apartment B. They have a forensics van on your front lawn. I hope it doesn't make any ruts in the grass. I hope so, too. I didn't have the money to resaw the front lawn. Chapter 9 Gossip I'm sorry, Greta. I should have told you the police are investigating the death of Carl. There was a momentary pause before Greta replied. Carl who? Do I know a Carl? He was the tenant in apartment C, I answered. Quiet Carl, the one we never heard from. He passed away last night. In the house? asked an alarmed Greta. I'm going to have to do a cleansing. No, I quickly told her. It wasn't in the house. He was found by the Silver River. The police are just doing their due diligence by looking at his apartment. I suppose, responded Greta, it just seems like a lot of police are here. They cordoned off the stairs. I had to tell them I needed to be able to go up and down and confirm I lived in the apartment before they would take down their crime scene tape. They are just being overcautious, I soothed her. Truthfully, I had no idea. Maybe they were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing during a murder investigation. I suspected it was a murder investigation. What with the missing laptop and the dent in Carl's head? Then again, it could all be completely innocent and nothing but a case of misadventure. That was what I kept telling myself. I am sure they will be done soon and things will go back to normal. I hope so, sniffed Greta. Are you on the list for the fall fair? You know I am, I replied. I always volunteer. We talked a little about the upcoming event before hanging up the phone. Who was that? Greta. I turned to look at my boss. A little older than me, he came over to look through the stack of files. She was wondering if Casings Insurance was going to sponsor one of the events for the Autumn Heights Fall Fair. Greta hadn't wondered any such thing. However, I couldn't resist asking Mr. Casings since I knew there was no way he was going to sponsor anyone for any amount of money. He was the type of guy who would get extra condiments from the fast food restaurants and put them in the staff fridge, rather than purchasing them from a grocery store. 
Oh, I will let her know, nodded Mr. Casings, which meant he would never get back to Greta. I had worked here long enough to know what he really meant when he said things. So what are you up to? I tried not to look at him in disbelief. Every week I came in for two afternoons to do filing and reception. I held up a file in my hand and opened the appropriate filing cabinet drawer. Filing between getting the phones? Has it been a busy afternoon for you? Always, Mr. Casings proceeded to say as he went to another drawer, pulling out a couple of files and perusing through them. I happened to know the office had been very quiet this afternoon. His definition of busy and mine were completely separate things. The good news was I would be able to do some other work while waiting between calls. I still had advertising material to write for the upcoming Autumn Frolic. Autumn Heights had a number of festivals each fall because the canopy of beautiful orange, red, and yellow leaves which graced the town. Tourism brought in a large part of the town's revenue. Mr. Casings brushed past me down the hallway, leaving his files on top of the filing cabinets. I bit down a sigh and added them to my pile to refile. The side door opened and Mrs. Casings returned from her lunch, walking straight to me. Did you hear about Carl Smith? she asked breathlessly. Mrs. Casings was a notorious gossip. She spent her lunches with another group of ladies who liked to one-up each other on the latest talk of the town. Carl who? I questioned, pretending to draw a blank for a moment. I was hoping she would get the hint that I wouldn't have any gossip to add to her growing collection regarding Carl. Although, if anyone had let it slip that I found Carl's body, no doubt Mrs. Casings would be back, chastising me for holding out on her. The guy who was murdered down by the river, gushed Mrs. Casings. Right. I nodded slowly. Of course, this would be the biggest news making the rounds. Did they say he was murdered for certain? That's what Patty heard from Daisy Sumner, and we all know Daisy's husband is on the police force. Mrs. Casings lowered her voice like she was about to impart a secret. They said someone hit him over the head, broke his temple, and he died. How terrible! Somehow, her tone conveyed that she didn't think it was terrible at all. More like she thought it was exciting. Terrible, I echoed. The police have a suspect in mind, confided Mrs. Casings. That was quick, I blinked. Pesky hadn't said any such thing when he had questioned me at the apartment earlier today. Don't they usually take more time to investigate these sorts of things? Daisy said they suspect the person who found him. Mrs. Casings laid out that bombshell like it was the juiciest morsel ever. Who would think that it would be the very person who called it in to the police? The world tilted just a little. I blinked rapidly and reminded myself to keep on breathing. Daisy Sumner was a no-good gossip, I told myself firmly. It's shocking, isn't it? A murder in Autumn Heights! Mrs. Casings tried to keep the smile from her face, but her eyes sparkled at the excitement of it all. Chapter 10 Unwanted Company and an Unexpected Guest I tried to tell myself that Pesky wasn't that incompetent. The police force would surely perform a complete investigation, and Daisy Sumner had misunderstood whatever she had overheard from her husband, Officer Sumner. I hadn't committed any murder, and I was not going to jail, I admonished myself sternly. Still, none of my internal pep talk was making me feel any better. I had finished the filing and was sitting at the desk while the clock clicked each agonizing second off in the background. Thankfully, Mrs. Casings had a call and bustled off to her office no doubt to disclose more details to the next poor soul who bothered to listen. Jerking my gaze away from the front window, I decided to do something useful. Opening the bottom drawer of the reception desk, I rummaged through my purse until I found Carl's emergency contact sheet in the rental agreement. I quickly glanced over it. The emergency contact information was blank. 
Why hadn't he filled it out? I wondered. I was certain I had asked him to write down the important information. Unfortunately, it appeared I had no one to call to tell them about Carl's demise. Plus, no one to take Carl's cat. I sighed. I hoped Cat wasn't going to get attached to the feline. It appeared I would have to try to find the cat a home. Stuffing the paperwork back inside my purse, I shut the drawer, just as the bell tingled over the front door. Maisie Alderson. Just great. Maisie was Daisy's daughter in every way. I had gone to school with her. She had been the one person I could have done without. Now her self-importance was even more inflated by her being married to one of the local councilmen, Dave Alderson. I pasted a forced smile on my face. Maisie? Violet, said Maisie in surprise. I'm not sure why she was surprised. She knew I worked here on occasion. It wasn't a national secret. Can I help you with something? I'm sure you couldn't. Her voice dripped honey, even as she eyed me with distaste. How is your daughter, anyhow? Cassandra, right? Katrina, I responded coolly. She's doing great. I have high hopes for her. I'm sure your mother had high hopes for you, came Maisie's tart reply. She faked a look of surprise. Yet your mother ran out on you, didn't she? It was your dear aunt who raised you. Bless her heart. I smiled grimly. My aunt was wonderful, like a second mother. She would have to be, agreed Maisie. She tapped a perfectly manicured fingernail against her chin, pretending to think. People do have a habit of running out on you, don't they? First your mother, who knows who your father was, and later Cat's father left too. What a pity! One might think there was something wrong with you. Maisie, why are you here? I cut to the heart of the matter, tired of being insulted. Do you need to see one of the casings? I'm here to pay a bill. Maisie reached into her purse, then hesitated. I can take care of your insurance payment, I patiently said, trying to be a good employee. She zipped her purse back up. Perhaps I'll come back when Mabel is here. It's confidential, you know. As if I would be the one spreading around what her insurance rate was. One, I knew exactly where her file was and could look up the information at any moment. Two, Maisie was the gossip, not me. Of course, I agreed. Mabel could take care of it. It would be one less thing for me to do. I fully understand. Maisie! A delighted Mrs. Casings came out of her office. How lovely to see you! Yes, lovely. I muttered as Mrs. Casings and Maisie did air kisses on each other's cheeks. Did Mama tell you the latest? wondered Maisie. Can you believe it? Such a dreadful thing! Who knew someone in Autumn Heights is prowling about and knocking people on the head? shuddered Mrs. Casings dramatically. I have heard something new, disclosed Maisie as she leaned toward Mrs. Casings. The police are looking at the landlord of the deceased as a potential suspect. What? I blinked in astonishment. They couldn't be serious, could they? Maisie and Mrs. Casings looked at me like they had forgotten I even existed, until my impromptu outburst. Why don't we go into my office where we can have some privacy? Asked Mrs. Casings, the censor in her voice directed at me. Absolutely huffed Maisie, preceding Mrs. Casings to her office. They couldn't be right, I tried to reassure myself. Why would anyone think that I would kill Carl? He was my tenant. I was losing money by having the apartment vacant. Besides, no one would be stupid enough to find the person they had killed and phone it in to the police. No. They were just a bunch of gossiping people who wouldn't know the truth if it hit them in the face. Imagine if they realized I was the landlord and the person who found Carl. What would they say then? Good thing the gossips hadn't figured that out yet. I didn't even want to imagine what would happen if they did. 
Hopefully, the police would arrest someone soon for the murder, and everyone could just forget about me. My cell phone rang its merry little tune from my purse in the drawer in the desk. Opening the drawer, I quickly rummaged around until I had it in my hand. I frowned as it appeared to be an unlisted number. Hello? Miss Violet Resauter? I recognized the voice as Officer Pesky's, and my heart leapt in my chest. I drew in a deep breath and reminded myself I was not guilty. No one got arrested on the phone, and it would be okay. Once again, I ignored his mispronunciation of my name. Yes? Officer Pesky here. I need you to come down to the police station. I tried to swallow. It ended up being a lump in my throat, so my voice was very hoarse as I replied, Why? Your daughter, Katrina, was found interfering with an investigation. I need you to come and sort this out. Chapter 11 Parenting What were you thinking? I questioned Kat as we were leaving the police station. It had been a tense hour, waiting in the station for Officer Pesky to come and lead me to the room where they had held Kat. I felt like he had been deliberately keeping me waiting. Once I was reunited with my daughter, Pesky waxed long on how children should be kept under control and not be found wandering crime scenes. I had to agree, while Kat sat silently with her arms crossed, her shoulders hunched. Finally, Pesky stopped lecturing the both of us and let Kat go with a warning. I signed paperwork, and the police released Kat's bicycle into our care so we could leave. The street lights were starting to come on and I was hungry. I was annoyed at having to leave work early just to come and sit at the police station. I was also extremely worried about my daughter. Kat had never given me any trouble before. I could count on her to be home on time, do her homework, and help around the house. She was the best kid I could ever have hoped for. Kat, you need to talk to me, I said as I unlocked my bicycle. What happened? I don't want to talk about it, declared Kat as she waited for me. Tough, we are going to talk about this, I replied sternly. Not here, stated Kat firmly. Not where people can overhear. Fine, we will discuss this at home. I began pedaling. It wasn't long before Kat passed me, heading straight home. Once there... I noted the crime scene tape on the door of Carl's apartment as I put my bicycle in the shed alongside Kat's. Locking the shed up, I noticed Kat had already unlocked our door and was inside. I followed her in, shutting the door behind me and kicking off my flats. Kat? I'm in the kitchen, came Kat's reply. The high-pitched beeps from the microwave told me she was setting the timer. There is leftover chicken fried rice if you want some. Going to the kitchen. I grabbed a plate and started spooning rice onto it from the delightful dumpling carton. Why were you at the Silver River today after school instead of home doing your homework? Can we talk about this later? grumbled Cat. I'm hungry. No, we are going to talk about it now, I responded, setting down my plate so I could turn my full attention to her. I would like an answer. With a huffing sigh, Cat pulled her now hot plate out of the microwave and put it on the table. She crossed her arms and frowned at me, her eyes troubled. Pete Pesky said his dad thought you were suspicious in the whole Carl murder thing. He kept saying you were going to jail, and I was going to be an orphan for real, not just in the cemetery tour. Since when do you listen to Pete Pesky? I asked. Pete Pesky was Officer Pesky's son. He had skipped a grade to get into cats, and the two of them were always butting heads. His dad is Officer Pesky, muttered Cat. Pete just wouldn't stop. All day he was just shooting his mouth off, and I just thought if there was something the police had missed, some clue, then maybe everything would be fine. You wouldn't be on Pesky's shortlist, and the real killer would be found. Sweetie, that's not your job, I sighed. Coming forward, I gave her a hug. Your job is to be an amazing daughter, good student, and generally happy. It's my job to worry about the big stuff. 
But what if they do charge you with murder? Her muffled voice came against my shirt as she hugged me tightly. We don't have the money for a lawyer. And I don't want to live with Graham and Gramps. Well, since I didn't kill Carl, I think I'm safe from being tossed in jail, I stated firmly, ignoring the butterfly of fear in my chest. Please stop worrying about this. Are you sure it's going to be okay? That Pete is just a jerk? She asked worriedly. I'm sure, I repeated. Now eat your food before it gets cold. Cat nodded and slowly let me go. Can we watch television in your room tonight? Sometimes, when Cat was scared as a kid with thunderstorms, she would come to my room and we would turn up the volume on the old black and white television in there, pretending everything was right with the world. As she got older, Cat mostly faced her fears on her own. However, every once in a while, she would still ask to come to my room to watch the old television set. Usually, she ended up sharing the queen-size bed with me. As long as we go to sleep on time, I offered. It's a school night, and if you have any homework, it needs to be done. I know, I know. Cat grabbed a glass of water before sitting down to her meal of leftover Chinese and whatever else had caught her fancy in the nearly bare fridge. I really needed to go grocery shopping. The list had gotten bigger this week, and I was waiting for payday. I probably should have saved the money from last night's takeout and used it for groceries instead. Rummaging through the fridge, I added to my plate and put it in the microwave to heat it. There was something the police missed, though, suddenly blurted Cat. Chapter 12 A Clue Excuse me? I couldn't quite believe my ears. I found something, repeated Cat, something the police missed. My fourteen-year-old daughter, looking over the crime scene, had found something the cops had missed? I frowned. I did, protested Cat, sensing my disbelief. I found a clue. Even Officer Pesky said so, although he wasn't very nice about it. What did you find? I questioned. A drink container. She sought to clarify what she had said. You know, one of those stainless steel ones with the rubbery plastic tops that keeps stuff super cold or super hot for hours? The good brand from the Cluck Cafe. It had dried up brown stuff on the bottom. I thought it was mud, but Bryden said it might be blood. Cat's voice trailed off guiltily. Bryden was with you? My voice may have been a little sharper than I had intended. Cat flushed, but continued bravely. After Pete was so rude today, Bryden was nice to me, okay? He said to ignore pesky Pete, then we got to talking and it just made sense to go looking together, because one of us might find something that the other person would see. Don't call him pesky Pete, I absently chastised, even as I ignored the fact that we had called his father pesky pesky in high school. Pesky might have been a senior when I was a freshman, but he had been very annoying. Well, he is terrible, muttered Cat. Did Bryden get caught? What did his parents say? I wondered. His dad came to get him at the police station, revealed Cat. He was really red in the face. I think Bryden is in a lot of trouble. You are in a lot of trouble, too, I told her. What was I supposed to do? Cat had never done anything so foolish. I had rarely ever had to discipline her. I am going to have to think about your punishment. Cat nodded, slumping in her chair. Her fork toyed with her food. I just wanted to help. I sighed. Her heart had been in a good place. However, she should never have been there. Let the police do their work. I don't want to hear about you getting involved again. Do I make myself clear? Yes, nodded Cat, her eyes downcast. I mean it, Cat. I told her sternly. I know, she replied a little sulkily. And I think you should stay away from Bryden for a little while, I added. Her shocked gaze immediately found mine. That's not fair. He didn't do anything. He helped you get in trouble, I stated firmly. If he were more responsible, he would have tried to talk you out of your mad idea to go to the crime scene. Her eyes filled with tears. 
and she jumped up from the table, turning to leave the room. Cat, you're not finished with your dinner, I exclaimed. I'm not hungry, she insisted as she left. I sighed. Probably being forbidden to see Bryden for a little while might have been a bit much. However, I had a hunch his parents had probably said the same thing about my daughter being irresponsible and to stay away from her. Life wasn't fair. Cat needed to learn the lesson. I began clearing the dishes when Cat came out of her room, clothes in her hand, stomping towards the laundry room. Hey, I raised my voice. You aren't supposed to go in the laundry room. I haven't wrapped your present yet. Cat's birthday was coming up. I had bought her gifts and, as tradition, put them in the laundry room for wrapping. Cat knew she wasn't allowed in the room the week before her birthday. This year, I had managed to purchase a nice chess set, the complete set of the Camping Girl Mystery Series, and a gift card for the local spa. The icing on the cake was tickets to a show in the city I knew Cat had been dying to see. I need clean clothes for tomorrow, insisted Cat, a militant set to her jaw. I can't go to school smelling like sweat and gym. I was about to say I would do her laundry when she barged into the laundry room. Great. There would be no surprise for her birthday when she looked at the shelf with the laundry detergent. Setting down the dishes, I briskly walked to the laundry room. If you would just have waited a second, I would have. There, in the tiny room, Cat had set her laundry on the washer and was hugging Carl's black cat with tears in her eyes. Oh, Mom, he's perfect. Thank you. A pit formed in my stomach. We were keeping the cat. I had a tired smile. Happy birthday? What else could I say? Chapter 13 A Cat Named Boo I spent the night on my newfound friend's bed. She was absolutely delightful. Of course I made certain to purr and get pets before finding a perfect spot at her feet for the night. The fact was not lost on me that this girl named Cat was the only reason I was still in the house. How serendipitous! A girl named Cat, owning a cat. I nearly chuckled at the thought. The mother, Violet, liked cats well enough, but didn't feel the need to keep me. Now that the man named Carl had abandoned me, I needed this new home. I had no desire to end up in a shelter with barking dogs and yowling cats. One cat was quite enough, thank you. There was no need for any further pets beyond myself. I stretched in the morning, cracking open an eye and looking at Cat. She had named me Boo, as I recalled. What a silly, childish name. A black cat named Boo in the spirit of Halloween. However, I could hardly complain when it meant a nice home, food, and pets. I supposed I would have to try to remember it and come when she called. Well sometimes. An alarm went off, and Cat sleepily hid it before wiping her eyes with her fingers. What I could do if I only had fingers, I thought to myself a little enviously. Then again, I could do much more with my claws. I gave a soft meow to remind the girl I was still here. Shh, whispered Cat. She gave me a pet, then turned on a soft light and threw off the covers. Tiptoeing, she grabbed some clothes. It wasn't even light out yet. What was the girl up to? I watched curiously as Cat quickly dressed. It was obvious she didn't want to wake her mother. For a moment I toyed with the idea of sabotaging her. She was young, but soon enough would go off to college, leaving me behind with the mother. I would need to be in Violet's good graces if I expected to stay. However, snitching on Cat so soon might make her change her affections for me, and I needed her good will to remain at their home. A dilemma. Cat shut off the light, and carefully opened her door slipping out of the room. I chose to stay silent and padded after her into the hallway. I was not about to be left behind. All cats love secrets, 
and I was determined to find out what this was about. Watching Cat grab a key off the king ring, then slipping on her shoes at the back door, I calmly waited, my eyes narrowing. I was going to have to time this exactly. It was a good thing it was getting dark. Cat would be less likely to see me. She unlocked the door and slipped out into the early morning. With impeccable timing, I crept out with her, barely managing to make it through before the door softly closed behind her. I hoped Cat wasn't going far, or on her bicycle. It was probably folly to have come out of the safety of the house. However, she was now mine and I was now hers, so I was intent upon following her. She walked briskly to the bottom of the stairs to the upstairs apartments. Slowly making her way up, Cat tried not to have the stairs creak under her slight weight. What was she up to? She couldn't possibly be visiting the older woman, Greta. Greta only got up when the sun was shining. I heard her bustling around her apartment each morning, getting her tea and toast with jam, before going to the balcony to watch the sun and read the newspaper. I liked Greta. If I hadn't been adopted by Cat, she would have been a good choice to live with, were she agreeable to the idea. If she wasn't going to Greta, it was likely she was going to Carl's apartment. My ears perked up. Was she going to fetch my food and litter box? The one Violet had given me was okay as a temporary measure, but I much preferred my own. Using the key, Cat opened Carl's door. Again, I performed the maneuver of slipping in, as Cat ducked under the crime scene tape and entered the apartment. She locked it behind her and flicked on the light. I blinked, trying to adjust to the sudden brightness. While I was doing so, Cat moved forward and nearly tripped over me. Boo! What are you doing here? Wondering the same about you, I thought as she scooped me up, petting and clucking over me. Are you okay? I didn't mean to bump into you, softly said Cat. Of course she didn't. She hadn't known I was here. I rubbed my head against her, all forgiveness. Cat held me as she took a slow tour of the apartment. I meowed as I spotted my favorite tins of food, but she simply shut the cupboard on them. How disappointing. There was a soft knock on the door. I was unceremoniously dumped to the floor. My tail twitched in annoyance. Come in, whispered Cat, letting in a teenage boy. I didn't know him, but I wasn't a fan. I had no desire for any competition for Cat's affections. The last thing I wanted was for her to forget all about me for a boy. Sniffing, I narrowed my eyes, looking him over. He was taller than Cat by a few inches. He still had that awkward, growing into his limbs look, but had the promise of being quite handsome if it weren't for the pair of glasses on his head. Glasses. What a human invention. They were dark-rimmed, like his hair was dark. His eyes were hard to see behind the lenses, but I thought they might be blue. Have you found anything? he softly asked. I've only just started looking, replied Cat. Looking? I perked up. Looking for what? I knew exactly where everything was in this apartment. She had only to ask me, and I could lead her to whatever it was she was trying to find. Hey, there's a cat here. The boy stooped down to give me a pet, which I reluctantly accepted. Sweet. Do you know his name? His name is Boo, Cat informed him. He's mine. My mom got him for my birthday. Cool. I wish I had a cat, he said. Maybe he wasn't so bad, I decided, giving a purr. My mom will be waking up in about an hour, interrupted Cat. I don't want to get in more trouble after yesterday's run-in with the police. My dad just about took me off the track team sighed the teen as he straightened up. If I didn't need a scholarship for college, I think he would have. As it is, I have a long list of chores to do now. Then we'd better not get caught, whispered Cat. The two of them prowled around the small apartment, 
looking through everything as thoroughly as two teens could, which was actually pretty impressive, I thought. I followed each of them in turn, curious as to what they might be searching for. Bryden, did you see this? Cat wondered at the neatly spaced cans of food in the cupboard. I could have told her Carl was OCD neat. He brushed me twice daily and vacuumed the hair out of the brush. Sometimes I wondered if he might vacuum me. I shuddered at the thought. He's a bit creepy, your tenant, mentioned Bryden. His clothes are color-coded. Mom and I called him Quiet Carl, revealed Cat. I think I only met him once. What were they looking for? I wound myself around Bryden's legs, and he absent-mindedly stooped to scratch behind my ears as he looked through the closet. You wouldn't happen to know where Carl's computer went, would you, Boo? I straightened. Carl's computer? That was easy. I knew exactly where it was. Carl always put the laptop in the same place every time he left the apartment. I could have laughed. I suppose it was too much to ask, sighed Brayden as he straightened up. He shut the closet door. Twitching my tail in complete satisfaction, I turned and headed to the living room. I scratched my nails in a particular section of the carpet. I was going to be the hero of the day, I thought smugly. We should get going, mentioned Cat. Her shoulders slumped. Mom will be getting up soon, and you need to get home before your parents find you gone. Yeah, I guess so, agreed Bryden with a grimace. I'm sorry we didn't find anything useful. I pulled at the carpet. Batting it with one paw as I hooked my nails with the other. Narrowing my eyes, I concentrated as hard as I could. Tearing the piece of carpet was not as easy as it looked. Boo, we need to go, said Cat. She came towards me. What is he doing? wondered Bryden. Boo, stop tearing the carpet, scolded Cat as she crouched beside me, ready to pick me up. Mom will be unhappy if she has to replace the whole carpet because you tore up one spot. I arched away from her, determined. I knew this was what they had been looking for. I doubled my efforts. Is the carpet lifting? questioned Brayden as he went down on one knee. He used a hand to pull where I had managed to lift the edge of a perfectly cut corner in the carpet. Ah... If only I had opposing thumbs like theirs, I thought. It would have made it so much easier. Bryden continued to pull the perfect cut of carpet, which had been camouflaged before. It's been deliberately cut. Cad leaned forward, her hair tickling my nose. I sneezed as she touched the floorboard. Look, there's a notch. She pulled out the small cut piece of wood from the floor, which had been hidden from view by the carpet. Bryden reached down and pulled out the laptop. If cats could smile, I certainly did. Chapter 14 Golden Heights My alarm went off early, and I grabbed a coffee in the kitchen. Cat was already up and dressed. She had taken the time to have a breakfast of waffles warmed in the toaster. Want one? she asked. I'm running late. I'll see you after school. I said as I grabbed my purse. No after-school activities and stay away from Bryden. Cat sighed as she grabbed her paper route bag. Fine. I mean it. I heard you the first time, muttered Cat. She pulled out her keys to lock up behind us. I opened the garage door and grabbed my bicycle. This morning I was due for a shift at the Golden Heights nursing home. I had been working at the home on a part-time basis for years. I knew all the residents, and often subbed in for staff taking a vacation, or who needed a change a shift when no one else could cover. Have a good day, I called the cat as I biked down the lane. Have a good day, she echoed as she always did, closing the garage door and locking it before getting on her own bicycle. The sun was making itself known over the horizon. I enjoyed looking at the sunrise as I cycled through the town. It didn't take long to get to the nursing home. I swiped in and greeted Donna at the front desk before stowing my sweater in the break room. Work was uneventful until I noticed a shadowy figure head into Mrs. Gonzalez's room. I sighed. 
I liked Mrs. Gonzalez. She was ninety-eight, her body crippled by arthritis, but her mind entirely clear. In fact, she usually had a joke and a smile for all the staff. As I passed the room with the breakfast cart, I looked inside. Mrs. Gonzalez was chatting to the morning personal aid worker. She looked quite healthy for her age. Spying me, she gave a wave. Good morning, Mrs. Gonzalez. I'll see you in the dining room. I gave her a wave back and hoped my face was pleasant. There was a grim standing in the room. It stood respectfully in the corner, its skeletal arms folded as it waited patiently for death to arrive. Its face was hidden in the inky hood of its robes. I knew from experience Grimm's were never wrong. I felt a pain of sadness, but I also knew Mrs. Gonzales had lived a long and happy life. She had been talking about reuniting with her husband for the past few months, so maybe she knew her time was coming. I made my way to the dining room where all the meals were held for those residents who were still mobile enough for the aides to bring them for a communal meal. It was good for the residents to socialize with each other. It helped to stem the loneliness between family visits. Setting up the tables for the morning, I sniffed the delicious smells coming from the kitchen. What is it this morning? I asked Jane, the cook. Soft veggie omelets and egg puree for those who can't manage to eat the solids, replied Jane. Mr. Davenport has his usual insure. Smells good, I complimented her as I grabbed bibs from the cupboard to set out at the dining tables. Many of our residents were encouraged to feed themselves if they still had the ability. It helped them to retain their independence and muscle movement. I would serve and help feed those who needed assistance. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the hall. Jane and I exchanged a look of curiosity, and both of us went to have a better viewpoint at the dining room doorway. Officer Pesky and Sue Ling, one of the Golden Heights personal care workers, were talking loudly in the hallway. Sue was also a member of the cemetery tour actors. Both of them seemed oblivious to the crowd of onlookers they were drawing as personal care workers craned their heads out of doorways to watch, and the office staff spilled out into the hallway. "'I didn't do anything,' insisted Sue. "'I told you that already!' Pesky's face was impassive. "'Then how did your water bottle end up at the crime scene?' "'It's not my water bottle,' shrugged Sue helplessly. I broke mine. I meant to buy a new one from the Cluck Cafe, but I haven't. You have to believe me. It's not my water bottle. What did you do with your broken one? Questioned Pesky. I threw it in the recycling bin? It went out on trash day, moaned Sue. Please, I don't know whose water bottle you found, but it's not mine. We will have to take you to the station for further questioning, said Pesky, his face impassive. Wait, I interrupted. Deep down, I knew I shouldn't have said anything. The suspicion had been taken off of me and was now on someone else. It wouldn't be smart to have Pesky's attention focused on me again. I cringed a little as his gaze turned on me. Sue couldn't have hurt Carl. She was at the cemetery tour rehearsal with us. Everyone from the tour saw her. With the time of death, the cemetery tour rehearsal is not an alibi bid out Pesky, annoyed at my interference. I didn't kill him. You believe me, don't you, Vi? pleaded Sue, her eyes fearful. I believe you, I told her. I did. I had known Sue for years. There was no way she had killed Carl. I turned to Pesky. What possible motive would Sue have? That is what I'm going to find out when I question her, he said impatiently if you'll excuse us. I didn't even know this Carl guy, lamented Sue. I paused, watching a stricken Sue as Pesky took her by the arm, leading her down the hallway. For the first time since I had known her, I believed she had just lied. Something about her tone of voice or body language betrayed her, and while I did believe she hadn't killed him, Sue had certainly known Carl. Chapter 15 Getting the Gossip My day had been packed. Right after the nursing home shift, 
I wrote out some chores for Cat to do as a start to the punishment for having trespassed at the crime scene of Carl's death. Mostly it was painting, weeding, and general clean-up of the yard, something neither of us particularly enjoyed. I would have to figure out what to add to the list later. Perhaps Greta had unpaid chores she would be willing to have Cat do. Cat and I had an early dinner, since we both had to work tonight. I was waiting tables at the Fire Grill restaurant, and Cat would be working the front counter at the delightful dumpling. Her hours would be shorter than mine, which was perfect on a school night. Besides the paper route, it was Cat's first real job, and she had been holding it down for the last four months. I was proud of her. It gave her the option of spending money and savings. I, however, would probably not be home until ten at night. It depended on the number of customers. Hours later, and with sore feet, I leaned against the bar during a lull in customers, sipping from a glass of water. I was tired of hearing about Sue and Carl. It seemed to be the subject of the night, with everyone gossiping what they speculated about the murder. Was Sue guilty? Who was Carl? What about other suspects? The rumors flew. Crazy night, commented Dean, the bartender. He was drying glasses and setting them away. I think it was busier than normal, I replied. Everyone seemed to be here. Everyone wanted to know if someone had heard something they didn't already know about that murder here in town, Dean dryly mentioned. He flipped the bar towel over his broad shoulder after he put the last glass away. Dean was good-looking for a fifty-year-old bartender. His hair barely had any gray, and he had deep chocolate eyes. He was also part owner of the bar. Why didn't I flirt with him? His girlfriend Trina would probably claw my eyes out. Plus, she was way hotter than me, had no kids, and was the other part owner of the bar. I was no competition, and Dean was quite a bit older than me. I sighed. I can't believe the police think Sue could have done it. I can, remarked Dean. He lowered his voice and leaned in. I saw that Carl guy and Sue arguing two days ago at the farmer's market. Sue said she was done giving him money. She couldn't afford to any more. Then Carl told her she couldn't afford not to keep paying him. What? I looked at Dean, shocked. What did he mean she couldn't afford not to pay him? I don't know. Maybe it was for his computer services, shrugged Dean. Sue told him that he was eating all her profits from her business, so there was little point in paying him when she wasn't making any money. She would rather let the business fold. Wow. I tucked this bit of knowledge away. Sue loves her business. Sue had started a healthy diet plan business with supplements. She had been doing really well, showing her own progress on the plan on social media. She had plenty of followers and seemed to be on her way to being a local entrepreneur. Carl told her she wouldn't like it if word got out what was really going on in her business, revealed Dean. Then Sue just walked away from him. That's all I saw. Vi, table nine's ready for their bill, came Trina's voice. Coming right up. I forced a smile and went back to my job. Here I was, just as bad as the other gossipers, listening to rumors and hearsay. However, if what Dean said he overheard was true then maybe there was a motive for why Sue would want to kill Carl, even if I didn't believe she had done it. Perhaps someone had done the deed on her behalf? Crazy. I shook my head and told myself it wasn't my business. Another hour later, I collected my tips and bicycled home. The street lights provided ambience in the dark as I pedaled down the streets. A harvest moon hung in the sky as a gentle breeze made the leaves rustle. I shivered. All day, the thought of Sue being accused of Carl's murder hung in the back of my mind. I didn't believe she had done it. I knew from fresh experience it was horrible to be a suspect. I had no desire for her to go through the same worry as I had. Yet what could I do about it? I could only hope Pesky would find the real killer soon. Yet I didn't have much faith in him. Pesky didn't seem to be the type of cop who investigated things very well. 
Once I was home, I went through my bedroom routine as quietly as I could. Cat should be asleep by now. It was a school night. Even though Cat didn't officially have a bedtime or a curfew, she was usually in bed around 9.30 or so. I brushed my teeth, and on the way back to my bedroom from the bathroom, I noticed a faint light under Cat's door. Was she still reading? It was late. Cat had her paper route in the morning. It wouldn't do for her to be too tired and sleep in. More than likely, she had fallen asleep with a small reading lamp on her bedside table on. Gently turning the knob on her door, I stepped inside. A startled cat looked up at me. The light was emanating from the laptop she had opened on her lap. A laptop that I knew wasn't hers. Chapter 16 The Laptop Whose laptop is that? I wondered aloud. Did someone lend you one from the school? Um, maybe? Swallowed Cat. She looked at me with big eyes. Boo was on the pillow beside her, looking at the screen. He batted at a key on the keyboard. Instant suspicion floated into my mind. Cat was a poor liar. She usually prevaricated badly, or ended up making her answers sound like questions. Who gave it to you? Um, Mrs. Johnson? For a project? came Cat's reply with a guilty flush of her cheeks. Really? That was very nice of her, I commented, coming into the room and having a seat on Cat's bed. What project is it? Cat shifted uncomfortably. A social studies thing? I'm sure you wouldn't be interested. I think I am very interested, I decided. Why don't you show me what you've been working on? I gestured to the laptop. Now? gulped Cat. It's not finished. You know how I like to see your work in progress, I cheerily said, steel in my voice. Cat's shoulders slumped, and she turned the screen reluctantly my way. Are those videos? I frowned, looking at the tiny pictures on the screen. There are a lot of them. I'm sorry, apologized Cat. It's not for a social studies project. I didn't get the laptop from Mrs. Johnson. I wasn't about to tell Cat I already knew that. I gave her a sharp look as I pressed play on one of the videos. Then why lie about it? Because you aren't going to be very happy when you hear the truth, mumbled Cat, slouching down against her headboard. She picked up Boo, holding him close. On the screen I saw Dr. Lehman getting home from work. He stowed his briefcase under the hall table and pulled off his tie. Going to the kitchen, he grabbed a bottle of wine from his wine fridge. Lehman had a nice house, I reflected. There was a knock at the kitchen door, and Dr. Lehman pulled out two glasses as Maisie Alderson stepped inside. The two shared a passionate kiss, and I quickly paused the video, a little shocked at what I had just seen. Whose computer is this? Cat slumped down even further. Her eyes didn't meet mine as she muttered, Carl's? What? The word may have been uttered a little sharper than I intended, but I was just so gobsmacked. How do you have Carl's computer? Promise you won't be mad? whispered Cat. No, I told her. I can't promise that. Well, I took the extra key and went into Carl's apartment. When I was looking around, I found the laptop, shrugged Cat. What extra key? I wondered. I gave the extra key to Officer Pesky. There was a third one on the key hook by the door, supplied Cat. You should know that. You were worried about losing your key, so you made an extra. I closed my eyes and rubbed my forehead for a moment. How did you manage to find a laptop that several police officers couldn't even find? It was hidden under the floorboards. There's a slit in the carpet, and Carl made a little door. He had the computer and a few memory backup devices in there. Cat's solemn eyes that met mine. Video takes a lot of space. When did you do this? I questioned. You had no time today to be breaking into apartments, going through police tape, and magically finding missing computers. Before my paper route? murmured Cat. I got up really early. Cat, I told you to leave this alone. 
that you didn't need to get involved. I looked at her in disappointment. Pete Pesky said they were going to arrest you. I couldn't let that happen, emphatically stated Cat. And I did find the missing laptop. Now we have all sorts of other suspects who have motives to get rid of Carl. He was blackmailing half the town. Your fingerprints are on the laptop, I exclaimed. So are mine. Don't you think that would look suspicious to the police? Well, Cat's voice trailed away as the realization struck in that she might have really messed up. They aren't going to think that I killed Carl, are they? Bryden and my fingerprints are on the drink bottle, too. No, honey, they aren't going to think that you killed Carl. I sighed tiredly. Maybe we can wipe off our prints and somehow anonymously give the laptop and backup devices to the police. Then they can sort out the mess. I guess, reluctantly said Cat. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. I shook my head. Maybe you need to spend the holidays with Graham and Gramps. No, pleaded Cat. They serve tofu with everything. Last time I had to eat a slice of cheesecake for Gramps' birthday that was made out of tofu. It was so gross. I am going to seriously think about it as your punishment, I warned. No more investigating. Fine, muttered Cat. I mean it. I told her. I said fine, huffed Cat. The laptop is proof anyways that Quiet Carl is more like Creepy Carl. Anywhere he did home security services, he set up cameras to record the people in their home. He red flagged files where people were doing stuff they shouldn't. Then if you look at his spreadsheets for his financials, he was blackmailing those people for hundreds of dollars each month, depending what he thought their income was. That's terrible. I frowned. You figured that out in just a couple of hours? It wasn't hard, shrugged Cat as she petted a purring boo. All his programs were open. The laptop didn't have a password to access it. I might not be the best at computers, but I knew most laptops required a password or PIN to access any programs. Brian gave me a password code de-encryptor at school. Cat's voice trailed off as she looked at me apprehensively. Chapter 17 A Moral Choice I told you to stay away from him. I couldn't believe that she hadn't at least obeyed that direction. In my defense, you didn't put a specific time limit on the no-contact thing. Her words came out in a rush, trying to rationalize her actions. You said for a while, which could mean a couple of hours or even minutes, if you think about it so I could totally be forgiven for misunderstanding. A month, I decided firmly. Perhaps this would be punishment enough to make Cat think before doing something that would get her into trouble. Until November comes, you don't get to talk to him. No calling, no texting, no messaging, no contact. Am I clear on this now? Yes, softly said Cat. Her unhappiness was visible through her hunched shoulders and tense expression. Keep this up, and it will be until Christmas, I warned her. I'm adding to your chore list. How? Besides fixing the boiler or the roof, you've put everything on the list you already gave me. We both know I can't fix the roof or boiler, logically stated Cat with some exasperation. Plus, there are laws about child labor, you know. I'm sure it won't be that bad. I rolled my eyes at her drama. Says you, sighed Cat petting Boo, who purred louder, as if to drown out our conversation. I will find other people who need stuff done for free, and you can volunteer your time. It will look great on your resume. I responded tartly. I stood up, taking the laptop with me. Go to sleep. I need to figure out how to get this laptop to the police without having Pesky yell at me. In the morning, I expect the backups and anything else you filched from Carl's apartment to be on the kitchen table so I can send them to the police as well. It's not fair, sulked Cat. Bryden and I found the clues, and now all we get is punished. Next time, let the grown-ups handle it, I admonished her. Good night. Cat didn't answer me as I slipped out into the hall and shut the door behind me, taking the laptop to my room. I honestly couldn't believe Cat had deliberately disobeyed me. Never before had she done anything like this. Was Bryden a bad influence on her? 
had she been reading too many mystery novels? Was my perfect daughter finally rebelling? I hope not. I wasn't sure I had the energy for this behavior to continue. Sitting down on my bed, I thought about calling the police immediately. Yet, what could I say? That my fourteen-year-old daughter had outwitted them and found the missing laptop they had spent most of yesterday searching for? Oh, and I would prefer not to be a suspect, but here is the laptop with my fingerprints all over it. Pesky would have a field day with that information and would no doubt try to lock me in a cell with Sue. Maybe he would think we were in cahoots, killing Carl together. I drew in a deep breath, letting it out in a huff. My eyes were drawn to the laptop. I had a horrible thought. While I hadn't had Carl do any computer or home security services for me, had he put cameras in my apartment? Or Greta's apartment? I briefly debated whether going through the videos to look for any videos involving me or Cat would make me a bad person. Briefly. If I found any videos, I would want to delete them. Yet I knew from watching lots of crime television shows that the police would recover any deleted data anyways, so there really was no point. It was a dilemma. I found that while lost in my thoughts, I had opened the laptop. Acknowledging that I was just going to do it anyways, I gave a mental shrug, as curiosity had me browsing through the videos. It wasn't like I wanted to know what was going on in my fellow neighbors' lives. I just wanted to find out if there was anything on here that directly involved Cat and me. Then I would know how to handle the situation. Not that Cat or I had been doing anything wrong or illegal. At least that was what I told my guilty conscience. There were hundreds of videos, which meant there were now hundreds of suspects in Autumn Heights if Cat were right and Carl was blackmailing them from Dr. Lehman and Maisie Alderson, to even our mailman Barlow, who looked like he was pilfering people's mail if the video was any consideration. For a moment, I thought about shutting the laptop. Really, who was I to suddenly be looking at other people's secrets? Shouldn't we all have some privacy? Looking at the layout, I hoped to find a search bar where maybe I could type in my name or address so I wouldn't be peeping in on others' lives. Unfortunately, there wasn't one. I would have to keep scrolling to see if I could find anything relevant to Cat and me. Just as I was about to give up, I saw something that had me pressing play. Chapter 18 Caught on Video The camera was at a high angle watching Sue as she puttered around in her workshop. This was where she did her home business, packaging up her weight-loss supplements that she sold to the public. The workshop was immaculately clean, with good light filtering through the windows. I was guessing Carl had put the hidden camera up when he put in her home security system and had been spying on her ever since. It made me feel sad that anyone would stoop to such a level. Worse yet, he was my tenant, making me feel guilty by association, even though I hadn't known what was going on. Pulling my attention away from my inward thoughts, I watched as Sue put a heavy box onto the countertop. Pulling out a box knife, she cut the tape before pulling out packaging. Once she had thrown out the packaging, Sue took out several large plastic bottles. She popped the seals of each bottle. Grabbing a smaller plastic bottle from a different box, Sue set a funnel on the bottle and began counting out capsules into the smaller plastic bottle. I gasped in disbelief. Sue was repackaging someone else's capsules into her own packaging. Her whole health business was a lie. She hadn't found any special ingredient to help people lose weight. She was just upselling someone else's product as her own. Sue was lying to her customers. Turning to grab another box, Sue accidentally knocked a travel mug off the workbench. It looked like one of the expensive ones from the Cluck Cafe. She bent down to pick it up, holding the canister and the now broken lid. It had split in two. I pressed pause, 
but the video was already ending. The screen reverted back to showing a bunch of videos, ready to play, of different people Carl had been spying on. Sue had told the truth about her water bottle being broken. However, she could have bought another one before meeting Carl. Sue had a motive. A water bottle just like hers was at the crime scene with blood on it. She had lied when she said she didn't know Carl. Dean had overheard Sue and Carl arguing. Had I been wrong earlier when I had thought that Sue hadn't killed Carl? Could she have done it? The seed of doubt planted in me began to bloom into a full-grown plant, and my stomach sank. I liked Sue. We weren't friends that hung out together, but we did say hello and ask about each other's day. She was always pleasant to me. Thinking that she might be guilty of killing someone made a sour taste in my mouth. Yet what could I do about it? It was obvious the laptop had to be brought to the police. I hated the thought of Pesky's reaction when I handed it in, but I could see no other option. Then again, what if Sue was innocent? She had said her water bottle had been thrown into the trash, that she hadn't killed Carl, and at the time I did believe her. Maisie Alderson had motive to kill Carl, so did any number of people if all these videos were any indication. I frowned as a thought came to me. What had Kat said? There was an Excel sheet of who he was blackmailing? Everyone on that list was a suspect. What if Sue wasn't the killer, and one of the people Carl had been extorting money from had killed him? What if Pesky only looked at Sue's video, and she went to prison for a crime she didn't commit? The whole scenario made my head hurt. A glance at the clock on my nightstand showed it was getting late. I had to be up on time for work the next morning, but that didn't stop me from opening the Excel sheet. At first it was all a blur of numbers. I admit math has never been my strong suit, and as soon as I could I stopped taking the class. The basics I could do. Algebra and all that other puzzling stuff? Not so much. However, the more I looked at it, the more it made a horrifying sort of sense. Carl had been blackmailing a large number of people. While each mount wasn't particularly staggering, the tallies at the bottom of the columns were. He had been raking in significant cash. I swallowed in disbelief. With the money Carl had been making, I could fix so many problems in my life, do so many repairs on the house, send Cat to a proper college, and maybe even take a vacation for the first time ever. It was tempting. I squelched down the feeling of envy. It wasn't my money. It was illegal. It was wrong, and I was not about to take over Carl's accounts and go blackmailing people in the town I loved. Before my errant mind started going further down that bad idea path, I decided to delve deeper into Carl's extortion of Sue. The good thing about the program was I could perform a search function. It wasn't long before I had found a history of payments from Sue to Carl. He had indeed been blackmailing her for a steady amount for months, dating past last year. Lately, Carl had raised the price. This was probably why Sue had been overheard saying she couldn't afford to keep paying him. I could see the last two payments were delinquent, Sue had stopped giving Carl money. Or maybe she had been negotiating for more time to pay when they argued. Perhaps the argument got out of hand, and Sue had hit Carl over the head with her water bottle, an unlikely strike to the temple, causing him to die. It seemed unlikely. While Sue was a runner, I had never known her to frequent the gym or lift weights. She was a petite woman. While Carl wasn't tall, he was average height for a man. Could Sue have had enough strength and height to knock him on the temple? Had she taken him by surprise? Could she have done it? Feeling awful, I shut down the spreadsheet and closed the laptop. I really didn't want to know any more. Tomorrow, I would hand in the laptop to Pesky, deal with his no-doubt extensive admonitions and try to figure out how to deal with my newly rebellious daughter. Chapter 19 Eavesdropping at the Cluck Cafe 
The morning came early and unforgivingly. I blinked at the wane light coming from my window, frowning as I checked my wristwatch. Oh, crud, I moaned, flinging the blankets off me. I stumbled through my room, grabbing clothes and running a brush through my hair. Breakfast and makeup were non-existent as I raced through the house, collecting my house keys and purse on the way out. Needless to say, I was late. I had forgotten to set my alarm. Rushing, I pedaled as hard as my bike would let me, working up a slight sweat in the crisp, cool autumn morning. Quickly, I locked up my bike and raced through the back door of Cluck Cafe. Peeling off my coat, I exchanged it for a black apron and name tag. Late, unnecessarily observed my co-worker Tilly as she brushed past me to grab a box of cups from the shelf nearby. Yeah, I agreed breathlessly. I tied my hair back into a ponytail before washing my hands. My alarm didn't go off. How unexciting. I would rather hear you had an adult overnight guest who you slept in with after a torrid night of passion, complained Tilly as she headed for the front of the cafe. I have an impressionable teenage daughter, I retorted as I followed Tilly. There are no adult overnight guests in my house. There hadn't been passion for years, I wryly reflected. I had been too busy being a mom and trying to keep a solvent enough to eat. You're boring, reiterated Tilly as she refilled the takeout cup station with supplies. There isn't time for chit-chat, remarked our manager, Karen. Her sharp eyes gave me an irritated look as her thin lips pursed. Your pay will be docked. I nodded and quickly got to work helping to serve coffee and simple sandwiches, plus bakery treats to the long lineup of customers. Cluck Cafe was nestled in the downtown core, in a building probably five times older than me. It had wooden plank floors, light brick walls, and a huge bay windows at the front. Inside, the owners had gone with a chicken theme. There were ceramic eggs and chickens on the counters, shelves, and even the bathrooms. A clock crowed on the hour. A hen and chicks graced our takeout pamphlets. Our breakfast menu was our main selling point with several different types of egg sandwiches. Hours later, we slowed down a little, and I was clear of the seven small tables in the coffee shop when I spotted Joan looking at the cups and travel mugs on the shelf near the till. Hi, Joan, I greeted her. Are you feeling better? Excuse me? Sharply questioned Joan as she abruptly turned towards me. A mug caught her scarf and toppled off the shelf. Stepping forward, I caught the mug before it could fall to the floor. I set it back on the shelf before replying. I hope you're feeling better. I assume you were sick since you missed the dress rehearsal for the cemetery tour. It's not like you to not be there. Oh, sighed Joan, her shoulders relaxing before she quickly agreed with me. Yes, I am feeling better. I had a sore throat and couldn't speak. Well, I'm glad your voice is back. I smiled. We need you for sure for the actual tour. I will be there, nodded Joan. She swiftly grabbed a random water bottle from the shelf. I better go pay for this. I lost mine somewhere and need a new one. Have a good day, I automatically said as Joan brushed past me to the till to purchase her item. Joan had always been a bit abrupt, but I found her to be more rude than normal. Perhaps she was late to get somewhere. I shrugged and kept on with my work, not thinking much more about it. However, Joan had given me an idea. Finding Tilly in the back, I asked her a question. Has Sue been in and purchased a water bottle within the last week? I knew Tilly was full-time at the cafe. She also had a wicked memory, which is why very few people could play cards with her anymore. If anyone would know if Sue had purchased another water bottle to replace her broken one, it would be Tilly. Ah, uh, no frowned Tilly as she washed a bowl in the sudsy sink. Why? Just curious. Quickly, I left to go back to cleaning tables out front. I didn't need Karen catching me talking rather than working. Wiping the surface of the next table, I noticed Maisie Alderson talking to one of her girlfriends, Tammy Farley, at a nearby table. I didn't mean to overhear what she was talking about but it was difficult since the two were talking in stage whispers, which carried through the cafe now there was a lull in the crowd since the lunch rush was over. "'What was his name again?' asked Tammy. "'Carson? Chris? Cameron?' 
I think it might have been Cardin, nodded Maisie as she sipped her mocha latte. He was such an evil little man. I knew it when he put in my home security system. I should never have let Dave talk me into having him in the house. Why do you say he was evil? The poor man is dead now. It's not right to speak ill of the dead, pouted Tammy as she leaned forward to catch the gossip from Maisie. Well, you didn't have him in your house since your John was too cheap to put in a house system, pointed out a superior Maisie. I know because I talked to the little man, and he had just emanated a bad vibe. Now he's dead, and I can't say I'm surprised. It's what happens to those types of people. I heard from Stephanie Pesky that he was a perfectly normal sort of person, sniffed Tammy. She took a large bite out of her apple turnover, pastry flaking around her mouth and down her shirt front. She ought to know since Wendell is handling the investigation. Maisie gave her a look of disgust. Whether over Tammy's contradictory remark or the mess that Tammy was making, I didn't know. Realizing I had been cleaning the same table for a good couple of minutes, I switched over to another a little further away. It didn't prevent me from hearing Maisie, who slyly questioned Tammy. Did Stephanie Pesky happen to say if Wendell found Carl's computer yet? Chapter 20 Too Many Suspects I sucked in my breath. Maisie Alderson had been on Carl's videos, passionately kissing Dr. Lehman. Why hadn't I considered she might be a suspect? Here she was, asking about Carl's computer. He probably had been blackmailing her as well. I could definitely see Maisie killing Carl, mostly because I disliked her so much. Then again, just because I didn't like someone didn't mean they were a killer. Vi! shouted Karen from behind the counter. If you scrub any harder, the table isn't going to have any finish left on it. I could feel my cheeks heat up as Maisie and Tammy stared at me. Quickly gathering my cloth, cleaning solution, and plastic bin I carried dirty dishes in, I made my way to the back room and began unloading the bin into the dishwasher. Out front, I could hear Maisie loudly complaining to Karen about workers who blatantly eavesdropped on customers. Maisie was of the opinion I should be fired. Karen agreed, but under company policy, she could only discipline me. I rolled my eyes so hard they almost fell out of my head. If Maisie would stop gossiping in public, or keep her voice to a real whisper, no one would be able to overhear anything. Setting the dishwasher to run, I came out to the counter just as Maisie and Tammy were leaving. Next time, just concentrate on doing your job, sighed Karen as she reached past me for more coffee filters. I hate dealing with customer complaints. I will, I agreed. It was easier than arguing about Maisie's propensity to gossip. Besides, Karen never lost an argument, even when she was wrong. The rest of the workday was uneventful. I did have a moment where I was a little upset I forgot the laptop at home. I had meant to drop it off as soon as possible to Officer Pesky. Now I wouldn't likely have the opportunity to turn it in until tomorrow. Right after work at the cafe, I was scheduled for a shift at the information desk at the Autumn Heights Town Hall. It's a volunteer position and my way of giving back to the community. I usually do a few hours there each month. Basically, we get a tiny bit of counter space near the reception area of Town Hall itself to help tourists with any questions they may have and freeing up the Town Hall staff to do their work. It's October, so we tend to have a lot of visitors at Autumn Heights. People love to tour the town with its fall colors. The trees are magnificent in their reds, yellows, and orange leaves. We get busloads of people who enjoy our fall festivals and activities. The cemetery tour we're putting on this weekend is a large draw with repeat visitors coming back each year to see old favorite legends and new history we manage to research. It's been fun being Mary each year. She is one of the favorites of the crowd, and I like to think that I do a good job in portraying her. Someday, I will have to pass the torch to someone younger who can continue the role. However. I hope to have a few more performances in me. Sitting down at the desk, 
I stashed my purse before putting the We're on Lunch Break sign back in the drawer. I typed my password into the computer and brought up a game of Killer Sudoku. It's a slow day. I only get to hand out a few maps and brochures between games as the time passes. I, however, do manage to beat my all-time high score for Sudoku, which probably isn't all that impressive since the only time I play the game is here at the information booth. A commotion from the reception area of the town hall catches my attention. The man standing at the desk is obviously upset and has raised his voice. I don't have the money, his voice carried in the quiet lobby. I'm sorry, sir, but the taxes are ninety days overdue. The receptionist tried to keep her voice hushed, but the acoustics made me just able to hear her response. Can't I do a payment plan? he asked in desperation. If you had come in during the first notice, we might have been able to, but it's not town policy to do payments on tax accounts so far in arrears. Perhaps I can make you an appointment with our supervisor, she offered. He might be able to help you. I haven't been able to work, explained the guy, running a hand through his hair. Things have been very tight lately. I had some unexpected expenses. I understand. I will make that appointment for you. Here is his card. She handed him a small business card. I expect he will call you this week to talk to you about the matter. The man muttered his thanks, taking the card. As he walked past me to exit the building, I can't help but notice it's Joan's son, Danny. I feel bad knowing about his financial difficulties. I had gone to school with Danny, and he was an okay guy who had a family and worked in construction. Joan had mentioned something about how Danny had a work accident a few months back and hadn't been back to work since due to injuries. I shrugged, shutting down my computer as the end of day approached when my phone rang. Digging in my purse, I looked at the screen to see it's Greta calling. Hi, Greta, I answered. What's up? Someone has broken into the house. Chapter 21 A Break-In what do you mean someone has broken into the house? I asked sharply. I came back from my yoga class, and the door to the upstairs apartment had been kicked in, explained Greta. I called the police right away, but I thought I should let you know, too. For a moment, I'm stunned. Who would do such a thing? Why? I have always felt safe in Autumn Heights, and suddenly, I'm not feeling so secure. Are the police there? They just showed up, revealed Greta. I'm going to go out to talk to them. Thank you, Greta. I will be there as soon as I can, I replied. My stomach clenched, and I dropped my phone back into my purse. Quickly closing things up, I grabbed my purse and headed for the exit. Unlocking my bike, I pedaled as fast as I can. When I get home, the police are once again on my property, going in and out of Carl's apartment. Greta spotted me as I bicycled up the driveway. Oh, Vi, they trashed the place. My heart sank. How bad is it? There's stuff strewn all over the place in the upstairs apartment. The door is off the hinges, and they broke part of the frame, sighed Greta, hugging herself. I didn't get to take much of a look inside before Officer Pesky shooed me out. My door doesn't have any damage, and I didn't see any sign that anyone was in my apartment. You should check yours before Kat gets home from school. She has a science project she's doing with friends at the library, I mentioned. Thank goodness. Maybe I can get the police out of here before Kat comes home. I would hate for Kat to see the police here. It's going to be bad enough to have to tell her what happened. The idea of someone breaking into the house has made me feel unsettled and vulnerable. What if we had been home at the time? What might have happened? Cat isn't due back until supper time. A shiver goes down my spine, and I see Pesky coming towards me. He looks very serious. Miss Resotter, Pesky says by way of greeting, and I stifle the urge to correct him. The damage is mostly contained within the front entryway of the apartment. There are muddy footprints in the carpet, but I expect a good cleaning will be able to get that out. From my previous inspection, it doesn't look as though anything is missing. What about my apartment? I asked. I haven't had a chance to look. Your door is still locked and there's no sign anyone tried to get in, 
responded Pesky. You should definitely have a look inside, but I think it's okay. I took a deep breath, relaxing a little. Thank you. I'm relieved to hear that. Where were you today? asked Pesky. I blinked. Surely he didn't think I had anything to do with this. I went to work and afterwards was at the town hall information booth. It's just procedure to ask these questions, Pesky assured me. I'm going to need names to verify where you were. Of course, I said stiffly. I provide him with my co-worker's names and tell him to ask the receptionist at the Autumn Heights town hall. When you left for work this morning, did you notice anything wrong with the upstairs apartment? Had anyone been asking you questions about the victim? Did you see anyone in the area who shouldn't have been? Pesky's rapid-fire questions annoy me, but I bite my tongue. No, it was dark and I was late for work, so I never looked at the apartment. All sorts of people are gossiping about Carl, but nobody's asked me any questions directly that I can remember. And no, I haven't seen anyone loitering around the street who shouldn't be here. A flash of irritation crosses Pesky's face, and for a moment I wonder if he wanted me to mess up in answering his questions. Fine. If you think of anything else, let me know. I will, I promise. And don't leave town. I might need to speak to you further about everything that's happened. You're still a suspect in this case, flatly states Pesky. He pulls out a business card with his name, badge number, and phone number on it. Even though he gave me one when I discovered Carl's body, I just pocket this one. Now is the moment where I should tell him I have the laptop, that my daughter found Carl's laptop and backup drives, which have all sorts of information about the people Carl has been blackmailing. Possibly one of those people is Carl's killer, and the police really should have access to that information. Maybe, if it had been one of the other police officers... I would have given them the laptop. I can almost guarantee that any other officer on the police force wouldn't be so annoying. As it is, my jaw is clenched shut, and there's no way I am telling this creep where the laptop is. I ignore the voice in my head that states things have gotten personal. Someone broke into my house. I need that laptop to figure out who it was to protect myself and my daughter because it's obvious Officer Pesky isn't a brilliant investigator. Okay, so I think he's a complete moron, just like he has been since high school. I also highly doubt he is going to solve this case since he still thinks I'm a suspect. I'm going to have to figure out who did this myself. Chapter 22 Still Too Many Suspects the police were leaving just as Kat came home from the library. She looked at them in bewilderment as the last of the officers got in their car and drove away. Mom, what's going on? questioned Kat, her curious eyes coming to rest on me. Someone broke into Carl's apartment, I explained. The police were here to investigate. Wow, breathed Kat, looking at the crime scene tape over the open doorway upstairs. That's scary. What if they come back? Does anyone know why the person broke in? They aren't coming back, I assured her, even though I had no idea. I don't know why anyone would break into Carl's apartment. I'm going to have to call a locksmith or a door guy who can rehang the door. I frown. Who would I call to fix the door situation, and how much was it going to cost? I sighed. This was an unexpected expense, and I didn't know when I could rent the apartment out again. I rubbed my eyes for a moment. I'll make supper while you call the repair guy, offered Cat. Grilled cheese and soup okay? Sounds perfect, I agreed. Twenty minutes after Googling, I managed to get a local fix-it guy to promise to come out tonight to look at the door and bring a sheet of plywood to nail to the frame so nobody could enter the apartment until a new lock or, perhaps if needed, a new door entirely will be bought. Coming back into the kitchen, I grabbed some dishes out of the cupboard to start setting the table. Mom, Cat frowns at me, why are the backup drives still on the kitchen table? I thought you said you were giving them to the police with the laptop this morning. Right, I nod, setting the plates on the table besides the backup storage devices. I meant to do that, but I was late this morning and had to get to work. I just forgot about it. But the police were here. You could have given them the laptop and drives then. 
says Cat, giving me a curious look as she stirs the tomato soup she's heating up. It slipped my mind, I lied. I'll bring the laptop and data storage to the police station tomorrow. I don't like lying. However, after my previous lecture to her, I am not about to tell Cat I have chosen to do some investigating of my own. It might seem a little hypocritical. What Cat doesn't know won't hurt her. At least, I hope not. We have a simple meal of grilled cheese sandwiches and soup. I ask about Cat's day and offer to do the cleaning up since she made the meal. Cat goes to her room with Boo to do homework. My hands are in a sink of suds when there's a knock at the door. Grabbing a towel, I wipe my hands as I open the door. Hi, my name is Jim. You called about a door needing to be looked at? A middle-aged, friendly-looking guy says. He has a tool belt and a pencil behind his ear. Yes, I nod. It's upstairs. We head outside and up the stairs to show Jim the damage to Carl's door. Someone sure did a number on this one, whistles Jim as he inspects the door and frame while tearing down the crime scene tape. Gonna need a new piece of wood here so I can secure the locking plate. I think I can salvage the door, and that will save you some money. Thank you, I breathe the sigh of relief. I really appreciate that. Yep, a new lock, piece of wood, a little paint, it'll be good as new. I will go get a sheet of plywood to cover the door for the night and be by tomorrow to do the repair work, confidently said Jim. I watch Jim go down the stairs to get his supplies. I enter the apartment to have a look to see if any further damage was done since I hadn't been able to go in while the police were here earlier. Someone has rummaged through the drawers and cupboards, knocking over items without caring. It made the place a bit of a mess. Looking around, I don't see anything that is obviously missing. There weren't any valuables here anyways, and I suspect the intruder was looking for Carl's laptop. The carpet is a mess. The person had come in with mud on their boots and tracked it all over the place. It was the only set of footprints, so I was fairly confident they belonged to the intruder and not any of the police officers. Besides, hadn't Pesky said something about the muddy footprints? Looking at them, I noticed they were quite large. I put my sneakered foot beside a print and concluded that unless it were an unusually large-footed woman, a man had broken down the door and tracked mud through the apartment. A shiver ran down my spine. As far as I was aware, I only had women for suspects unless Dr. Lehman was the one who had broken in here. Yet Dr. Lehman was short, even shorter than I was, and I truly didn't think he had large feet. Could he have worn a larger shoe and tracked the mud in on purpose, hoping to lead the police away from himself by laying a false clue? I really had no idea, and my head was starting to hurt. Going back to the kitchen, I picked up a couple cans of cat food before shutting off the lights and stepping outside so Jim could screw the plywood onto the door frame. I thanked Jim again for his time and promised to meet him tomorrow so I could pay him for his services after he repaired the door to the apartment. He gave me a quick estimate, so I would know what to expect for the cost, and I'm pleasantly surprised it's lower than I expected. Giving Jim a wave, I head back downstairs to finish the dishes and decide that tonight, after Cat has gone to bed, I am going to scour that laptop to find out just who killed Carl. Chapter 23 What to Do The next day saw me at the What the Fluff laundromat mopping the floors, taking out garbage, replacing a light bulb, and doing a few custom loads of laundry for a few senior citizens in the town. I yawned as I folded a set of fitted sheets. Last night had been a bust, and I had very little sleep since I had watched multiple videos. My suspects were mostly women, which didn't mesh with the manly footprints in Carl's apartment. The few guys who were on video doing anything remotely shady either paid each month on time, or were listed in Carl's notes as not blackmailable. I was stumped. Unless the killer was the spouse of one of the women, then I really wasn't sure how I was supposed to find out who had killed Carl. It could be anyone. I sighed. The only weird thing I had found out was Joan wasn't being blackmailed, which should put her off the list of suspects, but I had liked her because she didn't have a proper alibi 
and her water bottle was missing, which meant it could be the murder weapon. So much for that theory. My best suspects were Maisie and Sue. I just didn't believe Sue had killed Carl. Maybe I was wrong, but my gut insisted she was innocent. While she had lied to me about not knowing Carl, and she did have motive, her water bottle was broken, and Tilly hadn't remembered her purchasing a replacement, so she didn't have access to the murder weapon unless she had borrowed someone else's. Although, was a Cluck Cafe water bottle the murder weapon? I really didn't know. I had just assumed it was since Cat had mentioned finding one, which had possible blood on it at the scene of the murder. I suppose Sue was back on the list of suspects. However, as far as I was aware, she wasn't seeing anyone, nor did she have any brothers who might fit the large boot prints on my upstairs apartment carpet. As much as I disliked Maisie, I didn't believe she would intentionally kill someone. Maybe it had been an accident done in the heat of the moment, while they were arguing. Would Maisie's husband, Councilman Dave Alderson, have killed Carl? Did he break into the apartment yesterday? I really didn't believe he would. Dave would more likely just file for a divorce and walk away from Maisie. Maybe he knew about the affair, maybe he didn't. I didn't know Dave that well, but considering he was overweight and usually took the easy way out on town council, I fully believed he wouldn't go through the effort involved in a murder. That was the impression I had from him. I always thought he and Maisie were made for each other. Finishing up by exchanging the bills and coins in the coin change machine, I deposited the money in the safe. Locking up the office, I grabbed the last of the laundry, sorted it into the right bags, and put those bags in a small cart I had hooked up to the back of my bicycle. As I peddled the orders back to my customers, I thought about what had happened. All I really knew was Carl was dead, probably from someone he was blackmailing while meeting with them near the Silver River. He had been killed from a blow to the temple. The person who broke into Carl's apartment was male. I didn't know whether that intruder was the murderer or an accomplice. Perhaps they were someone else who was being blackmailed, but had nothing to do with the murder. It was very frustrating because I needed more information. I wanted this person caught. I didn't want to carry around the fear that someone might try to break into my apartment next. So I was going to catch the murderer and give the laptop to the police once I had done so. Dropping off the last package of clean laundry to Mrs. Oberman, I rode my bicycle back to my house to meet with Jim. Propping my bike up against the railing of the porch steps, I made my way up the stairs to find that the repairs were already completed. Jim gave me a smile as he straightened up from putting the lid back on a can of paint. Just got done. Mind the door frame and door. They're still wet from the paint. I expect only take an hour or so to dry with the sun being out today. It looks really good, I say as I inspect the door and frame. Other than a new door lock, I wouldn't have been able to tell there had been any damage to the door or frame at all. Thanks, replied Jim, wiping a paint streak on his already painted jeans. If you ever need another small job done, give me a call. I will, I tell him. Pulling out my pocketbook, I grab my checkbook. Is the cost the same as the estimate you gave me last night? Sure is, nodded Jim. I was able to reuse the door, so nothing added to what I quoted. Perfect, I breathe in relief. Going inside to the kitchen counter, I write out the check for the agreed-upon amount. I did pick up a mouse trap for you, said Jim as he accepted the check from me. I noticed there was a hole in the frame, and while it might be an old one, I just wanted to be sure that if it was recent you could trap the varmint. It's a live trap, so you can let him out a few blocks away. I also plugged the hole so it shouldn't be a problem in the future. That was kind of you. I handed him the check. What do I owe you for the mouse trap? I can pay cash for that. Nothing. Jim waves away my offer of repayment, handing me the set of keys for the new locks. It's included in the cost. Thanks for the business. We say our goodbyes, and Jim loads up his supplies into his truck. I busied myself tidying the apartment in the meanwhile before the mouse trap caught my attention. Maybe that's what I need to do. Trap the Murderer Chapter 24 
laying a trap. The laptop and backup drives had told me all they could, so handing them into the police wasn't an issue. Saturday morning, I rode my bicycle to the station, and thankfully Pesky wasn't on duty, so I didn't have to listen to his lectures on interfering with police business. I explained to the desk clerk what had happened, and filled out numerous forms stating that Cat had found the computer, and I was turning it in. Scrawling my signature on the bottom, I handed the forms in, and was assured that Officer Pesky would follow up with me. Drat! I had rather hoped he wouldn't. I gave a tight smile to the desk clerk and left the police station. Unfortunately, it was Saturday. This meant that Casing's insurance was closed. However, I knew that on Saturday mornings, Mrs. Casing's could be found at the local garden club, as could Tammy Farley, who was just as much a gossip as her friend Maisie. Between the three of them, I fully believed Tammy would tell Maisie everything she might overhear. The entire town would know anything within the hour. They were that good at spreading news. So I went to the grocery store and picked out the saddest, droopiest, cheapest clearant plant I could find before bringing it to the library. Every second Saturday of the month, the Green Thumb Gardening Club held a meeting in the basement, promptly at ten o'clock. Smiling at the librarian, Marcy, I went down the stairs and directly to the meeting room where I could hear Mrs. Casings droning on about the merits of good fertilizer. Grabbing a complimentary coffee from the table set up to the side, I took a seat in the back, setting my sad plant beside me. Mrs. Casings looked at me a little askance, but continued with her boring presentation. I was late, and I had never been to one of the meetings before, which was why many of the ladies and gentlemen in the room turned to give me at least a cursory glance before returning their attention to Mrs. Casings. Tammy whispered something to the woman beside her, and I bet it wasn't a particularly complimentary remark about me. That was okay. I was here to get attention. It was all part of the plan. I pasted a pleasant smile on my face and stared directly at the presentation, ignoring any curious looks. It took another half hour before Mrs. Casings wrapped up the lecture on nitrogen versus ammonia. There was a spattering of polite applause which I made certain to join in just a little too enthusiastically. Getting up from my seat, I snagged the clearance plant, bringing it with me as I approached my part-time boss. Mrs. Casings, what an informative and interesting lecture. I have never thought about fertilizer being so compelling before. Mrs. Casings blinked at me in surprise. Vi, how lovely to see you. I wasn't aware you were a member. I've never seen you at the Green Thumb Club before. I'm thinking of joining. I lean in a little, lowering my voice. My house is a little drab these days, and I thought I should spice up the flower beds. It's important to beautify the town. I heard you were in the club, and I just knew you might have some recommendations about what I should do. Oh, yes. Mrs. Casing's eyes gleamed as she began to expound on different plants which might grow well in my yard with the sunlight and soil. I know Mrs. Casing loves gardening and plants. The front window of the insurance building is a veritable jungle of potted greenery. It doesn't take much to get her to chat about her favorite subject, and I nod in all the right places with murmurs of agreement. What on earth is wrong with that plant? interrupts Tammy with a disgusted voice. This one? I feign surprise, holding up my potted friend. I really don't know. That's why I brought it to the meeting. I thought Mrs. Casings would be able to tell me since she's such an avid gardener. Mrs. Casings is pleased with my compliment in front of all her gardening friends. She positively preens with importance as she takes the plant from me to examine. It's yellow. The soil is too moist. You have overwatered it, tutted Mrs. Casings. How terrible! I pretend some dismay at her remarks. How often should I water it? This receives some debate from different members of the group who have been eavesdropping on the whole exchange, and I get conflicting information until finally Mrs. Casings declares once a week should suffice. I thank her and fake to gasp as I look at my watch. Oh dear, I'd better get going. I can't be late for the cemetery tour. That's hours from now, frowned Mrs. Casings. Surely you don't have to leave just yet. Usually we go for lunch. 
I thought you might join us. I wish I could, I said regretfully. Will you be coming to the cemetery tour? That old thing, snorted Tammy. Why would anyone want to go to a play about dead people is beyond me. I enjoy going to the cemetery tour. Someone, an elderly gentleman, piped up. There are a few murmurs of agreement from the crowd. I'm so sorry I can't make it to the luncheon. I sighed and gave what I hoped was a sufficiently unhappy look to Mrs. Casings. I have to get changed, rehearse my lines with Cat one last time, and I still have to meet with Officer Pesky. Officer Pesky? questioned Tammy, suddenly looking a lot less bored of my presence. Yes, I nodded. He's meeting me at the beginning of the cemetery tour. I'm giving him Carl's laptop. You found Carl's laptop? gasped Tammy, grabbing my arm painfully. I decided to tell the truth. Well, an edited version of it. Cat found it. I'm just handing it in to Officer Pesky. I hope it will help find the person who murdered Carl. Chapter 25 Getting Ready Perhaps I had laid it on a little thick, I thought in retrospect. However, the way Mrs. Casings and Tammy's eyes gleamed over the tasty morsel of gossip, I knew it would be spread all over town before the gardening luncheon was over. Maisie Alderson and Sue Ling would know that I had found Carl's incriminating videos on the laptop. So would everyone else in town, which I was counting on. The cemetery tour was going to be more popular than ever before. And if Pesky was smart, he would hear the rumor and show up to fan the flames, even if it was just to lecture me some more. At the very least, he should wonder why I was telling everyone he was going to get the laptop at the cemetery before the tour when I had already handed it in to the police. Hopefully, Pesky was smart enough to show up. I actually wanted him there. If I was going to out the killer, it would help to have a police officer witness the whole thing. Or I could get charged for interfering in an investigation. I wasn't going to abandon my plan. Someone had broken into my house. I wasn't going to have anything worse happen to me or my daughter over Carl's death. I was determined to get this person behind bars so Cat and I could feel safe in my own home again. While Cat hadn't said anything about the break-in scaring her, she had crawled into my bed last night. Truthfully, I was glad she had. I was spooked, too, and having her there made me feel better as well. Placing the wilting plant in a spot of honor on my kitchen table, I warned Boo not to touch it. Leave the plant alone. It helped me out today and deserves to live if I can grow a green thumb. Boo looked at me doubtfully as I fed him some dry kibble. I didn't blame the cat. My house didn't have any house plants at all, except this sad specimen now on my table. I tended to kill plants with neglect, which is why I only had some plain bushes surrounding my house. Well, I had joined the gardening club, so that might have to change, I resolved. Besides, it would be nice to have some pretty flowers and flower beds around the house. Hopefully, it wouldn't cost too much. Grabbing my makeup case from my room, I started to work on my hair and makeup for the cemetery tour. It was a time-consuming process, and I was glad that I had started early as I accidentally overloaded the circuit breaker by heating up the curling iron and running the microwave to warm up a quick lunch. Grouching to myself, I grabbed a flashlight and headed for the basement. Flipping the breaker to return the power didn't take very long, and I could hear the door upstairs open and shut. Cat. I called out as I headed back up the stairs out of the cellar. Cat should be done with her shift at the delightful dumpling by now. At least, I hope it is her. For a moment, a shiver of fear runs down my spine, and I pause on the stairs, hoping it isn't someone else in the house with me, searching for Carl's laptop. My heart pounds as I creep up the stairs. I need to get ready, called out a breathless cat as she headed for her room. Did you let the seams out on the pants like we discussed? Crud. I slap my forehead in disappointment at my memory, but also feeling relieved it is my daughter who is home with me. I had entirely forgotten about the two tight pants. Get them for me and I'll grab my sewing machine. Mom, groans Cat, I can't believe you forgot. Well, with a murder and a home break-in, 
I think I could be forgiven for forgetting to alter a pair of pants. I roll my eyes. I'm doing it now. You can work on your makeup while I get this done. It takes longer than what I would like, but I manage to let the seams out a little so the pants aren't as tight for Cat. Now she is in no danger of splitting her pants. I toss them onto her bed so Cat can change into them before heading to the bathroom to finish curling my hair. Before long, we are bolting down a quick snack and head for the cemetery. Fortunately, the weather seems to be cooperating, as there are no clouds and the temperature is moderate for this time of the year. The afternoon is late and the sun is tracking across the sky as we store our bicycles near the cemetery entrance and walk to the meeting place by the mausoleum in the center of the cemetery. Most of the members of the amateur actor group are already gathered for the event. As we do every year, Joan will go over the expectations of the evening, ask if we have any further questions, and thank us for our hard work. We will all take our places near our graves and wait for groups of people to come through, touring the cemetery, so that we can explain our historical person's life and death. There's a group of volunteers at the front of the cemetery handing out maps and taking tickets. Sometimes, we do get a few people who didn't purchase tickets in advance, and were able to collect cash for tickets. All proceeds from the event go to beautifying the parks and cemetery of Autumn Heights. My stomach flutters with nerves as Joan is about to begin her little speech on the steps of the mausoleum. By now, it should be spread all over town about how I am giving Officer Pesky the laptop from Carl's apartment. Hopefully, it will draw out the killer. Chapter 26 Mary Becker's Grave as always, the tour begins at 5 and runs until 8. If anyone needs a break, put up your flag and I will step in for you while you use the facilities. Remember, it's important to have fun tonight and answer any questions you can that the people who are attending the tour have. If you don't know something, you can always send them to me. Many tourists won't know my name, so describe what I'm wearing when you tell them to find me. Don't forget to grab a few extra maps and also brochures for the festivals going on this month to hand out to anyone who loses their copies. We will meet here again promptly at 8. Thank you for all your hard work, and let's have a great Autumn Heights annual cemetery tour. Joan could probably do her speech in her sleep. She'd done it so many times. It's easy to see her mind is elsewhere as she fidgets with a brochure, and her eyes keep darting towards me, looking at the large messenger bag which is crossed over my torso. Everyone begins to disperse to go to their positions when Joan grabs me by the arm. Violet, you can't wear the bag. It's not period appropriate. Oh, I'm just going to set it down behind the grave. I promise no one will see it, I told her. I put a hand protectively over it. No one needs to know. It only has a large book in it, not Carl's laptop. Well, I suppose that's okay then, sniffed Joan. Her eyes darted towards it again, but her lips were pursed together, like she is holding back from saying something. Okay then. I repeated her words back to her and went down the path to my grave. Or rather, I mean Mary Becker's grave. I could only hope I wasn't putting myself in too much danger. It was a public place. People would be all over the cemetery very soon, and I didn't believe the killer would be so desperate to do something to me when there were witnesses. I suppose I hoped someone would tip their hand when they spoke to me and revealed they were the one who killed Carl. Taking a deep breath, I set the messenger bag behind Mary Becker's grave and shook out the skirts of my wedding dress. Pushing wisps of my hair back out of my face, I took a look around the cemetery. In just a few minutes, Joan would be letting people in for the tour. Cedric Parsons wandered down the path towards me. Hi, Vi. Good weather for the tour. It is, I responded warmly. I was wanting to talk to you about something he mentioned as he stopped near me. His eyes were serious, and a grave look came over his face. Even through the slash of the fake wound on his face, I could see he was concerned. "'What is it?' I asked. "'Rumor has it you have Carl's laptop with you, the man who was murdered recently.' At my nod, he continued, "'I don't think it's very wise to have it here. If I know about it, I imagine a great number of people know as well.' and I would hate for something to happen to the computer or to you. 
since the police station's closed for the evening to the public, and you can't turn it in until tomorrow. I think it would be best if you gave it to someone else for safekeeping. Someone you can trust with it. The laptop could have important evidence on it to catch Carl's killer. A vision of fear ran down my spine, which is silly. I know Cedric Parsons. He's a pastor with the local church. Everyone trusts him. Who do you think I should give it to? I tried to stall him as I cast about in my mind to remember if I saw a video of him on Carl's laptop. Well, I could look after it for you, offered Cedric. I was about to refuse him when a person came running across the grass at full speed, a man in dark clothes, hoodie up, as he raced toward Mary Becker's grave. Cedric pulled me out of the way as the guy scoops up my messenger bag and barrels past us. Stop! I yelled, pulling away from Cedric and chasing after the guy. I'm running as fast as I can, but he's getting further and further away. He turns down a path and cuts between a row of graves. Stop him! Chapter 27 The Laptop Thief It's Bryden who puts out his foot, tripping the guy. The runner falls to the ground, the messenger bag flying out of his hands to land a couple of feet in front of him. A crowd gathers around as I stumble to a halt nearby. I just needed the laptop, the man groans on the ground, clutching his knee. I just needed to delete a video. You were being blackmailed by Carl, I guessed, my hand on a stitch in my side as I tried to catch my breath. Did you break into Carl's apartment? The man sat up, his hood falling back, and there was a gasp from the crowd. Joan's son Danny looked up at me. I had to. I couldn't find the stupid computer. Shut up, hissed Joan as she pushed through the crowd. Danny, not another word. Racking my brain, I tried to remember any video from Carl's computer that involved Danny. I watched the videos. I don't remember one of you. What do you mean you watched the videos? Maisie Alderson paled as she stared at me in horror. You watched Carl's videos? You know everyone's secrets? No, not all the videos, I hastily explained at the expanding group of frowning people. I just checked to see who was in them so I would know who to suspect of killing Carl. After someone broke into the house, I had to find out who it was. But I don't remember a video about Danny. Of course you don't, snarled Joan, grabbing at her son, trying to get him to stand up. He's an upstanding citizen of this town. He had nothing to do with Carl. Danny looked confused at his mother, painfully getting to his feet. He hung his head in shame. Bryden picked up my messenger bag, holding it out to me, but I didn't pay attention to him. The reason I didn't see any video was because it was already erased. I blinked in surprise as the thoughts churned in my head. I didn't. Danny frowned at me as Joan pulled on his arm. No, you didn't erase it, I agree with Danny. Danny might have broken into the apartment to try to get the laptop, to erase the video of him, but he never found the laptop. You didn't find the computer the night you broke into Carl's apartment, which means someone else erased it for you. How could they erase it when the laptop was missing? questioned a confused Cedric. The killer had Carl's apartment key. I shivered as I thought out the details of what had happened aloud. The killer killed Carl, searched his pockets, and took his house key. The killer went to Carl's apartment and let themselves in using the key, which is why there was no sign of forced entry until Danny broke in. The killer erased Danny's video to protect him. Shut up, yelled Joan. You're all idiots. Come on, Danny, we need to go. Joan? gasped Sue in horror. Was it you? What did Danny do that he was being blackmailed for? wondered Bryden. It was your water bottle that was the murder weapon, I surmised. It was you, Joan, who killed Carl to protect your son. That's why you had to buy a new water bottle at the Cluck Cafe. It's also why you weren't at the cemetery to a rehearsal. I was sick. I had a cold, choked out Joan. Mom, groaned Danny, I told you I would take care of it. He was going to bankrupt you. Your wife was threatening to leave you. 
You might have lost custody of the kids, hissed Joan. She paled as she saw we had all overheard her remarks to her son. Straightening her spine, Joan gave us all a haughty glare. Carl was scum. You all know it. The world's a better place without him. You didn't have to kill him, whispered Sue, looking slightly green. I didn't mean to, huffed Joan. I was just so mad. He was ruining Danny's life. Danny's wife was going to take the grandkids from us. One minute I was yelling at Carl, and the next he was on the ground. I never meant to kill him, but I'm not sorry I did. Joan, said Officer Pesky as he stepped forward from the crowd, a pair of handcuffs in his hand. You're under arrest for the murder of Carl. Pesky didn't get to finish as Joan shrieks, letting go of Danny and suddenly grabbing Cat, pulling my daughter against her, a hand around her neck. Back off, yells Joan, her eyes wide and crazy. Let my Danny go, or I'll do something to her. Cat! I leapt forward, but Cedric grabbed my arm, preventing me from going to Cat. I pressed my hands over my mouth to prevent myself from pleading for Cat's life. My eyes darted between Pesky and Cat hoping he would do something. He was the police officer. He had to do something. It's going to be okay, whispered Cedric in my ear, but I could barely hear him, even though the cemetery was eerily silent, despite the crowd of onlookers. Mom? Cat's wide eyes met mine as she swallowed hard. Let my Danny go, growled Joan again. Joan, you need to let the girl go, said Pesky. He took a tentative step towards them, and Joan quickly backed away a step from him, still holding Cat, who stumbled backward with her. Stop walking, Pesky, warned Joan. Chapter 28 A Grim Situation From the corner of my eye, I noticed a dark, shadowy figure making its way through the crowd. Joan, there's no need to do this calmly responded Pesky as he took yet another step closer. The dark, robed figure came closer to Joan as well. Please do something, I frantically pleaded. Whether to Pesky or to the Grim, I didn't know. All I wanted was for Cat to be safe. I tried to move, but Cedric kept holding me back, his arms around me now as he tried to calm me down. Joan, please let her go. She didn't do anything to you. Please, just let her go. My words didn't seem to register with Joan as she held Cat tighter. Everyone, let's just give Joan some room and take a step back from her, suggested Pesky. The crowd moved back a little, but those in the back were pressing forward, trying to get a good view of what was going on. Danny, you need to go. Grab the kids and get out of town, ordered Joan. I'm not taking the kids from their mom, said Danny as he raked a hand through his hair. Mom, you need to stop this. Just let the girl go. Danny, do as I say, screamed Joan. Please let her go, I whimpered, tears blurring my vision. Everything seemed to stop, pausing as the Grim came to stand beside Joan. His features were disguised in the dark recesses of the hood of his robe. Slowly lifting up a skeletal hand, the Grim reached out and touched a bony finger to Joan's cheek. Danny, gasped Joan, her eyes widening. She stiffened before Pesky caught her as she collapsed. Cat! I held out my arms and my daughter rushed forward into them, now free of Joan. Cat sobbed against me. Safe as police and paramedics rushed onto the scene, I hugged Cat to me tightly breathing in her scent, glad she was okay. Blinking back tears, I watched as the Grim turned its hooded head towards me. Thank you, I whispered. Thank you. I swear, the Grim nodded before fading into the crowd. Joan was groaning on the ground, Danny by her side, as the paramedics examined her. Chapter 29 Hot Cocoa Wrapping the blanket firmly around my shoulders, I sat on the porch swing with Greta, who handed me a cup of hot cocoa. Cat was between us, a blanket over her lap and another around her shoulders. 
she shared her lap blanket with me, putting it over my legs. In return, I offered both of them a container of cookies. Cat and Greta each took one, and I grabbed a cookie as well before setting the container down on the side table near the swing. What a terrible evening, softly said Greta, adjusting her own shawl around her shoulders against the evening chill. I never liked Joan, but I certainly didn't expect this. She did it for her son. She was trying to protect him. I murmured. It doesn't mean that she should have killed Carl, but I can understand the reason why it happened. I overheard the police talking. They said Danny had gotten addicted to prescription drugs from his accident while working for the construction company. He was still off from work, scamming disability, and had turned to street drugs now that his doctor wouldn't prescribe him any more pain meds. His wife is threatening to leave him, and money is tight, said Greta. She shook her head sadly. How terrible, replied Cat, staring down into her cocoa. Someone said Joan had a sort of stroke? A T-I-A, clarified Greta. It was a mini-stroke, but she's expected to make a full recovery. I'm just glad Joan is in hospital, and it's over. I no longer have to worry about anyone breaking into the house or having a killer on the loose in Autumn Heights. I look out at the street, seeing the beautiful color of the autumn leaves in the street lamps. Sipping the chocolatey drink, I set the swing to gently swinging with a push of my foot. Did you know Maisie took your messenger bag? questioned Greta. A laugh bubbles up from inside me. She can have it. The only thing in there is an old coffee table book about the size of a laptop. What happened to the laptop? wondered Greta. I had already turned it in to the police, I explained. I wanted to be sure they had it before someone else tried to break into my house to steal it. Greta gave me a big grin. Maisie's going to be so upset when she finds out she stole a book and not Carl's computer. I'm okay with that, I smiled back at her, and all three of us started to laugh. Welcome to the town of Autumn Heights, where the leaves are colorful all year round and the murders keep piling up. During the annual Autumn Heights Fall Fair, it's all fun until Councilman Dave Alderson is crushed by an enormous jack-o'-lantern. The problem? Vi was closest when the strap holding the ginormous pumpkin snapped, and Officer Pesky thinks she had something to do with the murder. With a teenage daughter named Cat, a cat named Boo, and a grim following her around, Vi needs to figure out the truth about Dave before the police from Autumn Heights put her in jail. Find Two Drops of Chaos, Autumn Heights Book 2, on Amazon, coming August 1st, 2024.